There's nobody boss me around. Oh, he's in the little other side now. Oh. They moved the office. What's he gonna do? Throw something at the window? <laughs> so I'd like to open the council meeting for um, Monday, April 23rd. And we will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. And may I ask, Patricia Cullinan, would you feel like <laughs> leading That's us? That's part of it. <laughs> oh, and you can, if you don't mind coming to the podium so we oh. can get you on record. Oh, God. <laughs> Is there more to it than that? <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and, and to the Republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now, I believe, uh, City Manager, we were also in closed session. Do we report out? Yes, no, I'll be happy to report out. So we had two closed sessions, and there is, um, council gave staff direction, but there is no report out at this time. Thank you so much. And at this point, I would like roll call. Vice Mayor Harrington. Here. Council Member Edwards. Yes. Council Member Cook. Here. Council Member Henley. Here. Mayor Agramonti. Here. Thank you. And um, I would also like to know if there are any uh, changes for to the agenda. Anyone from the council? I would like to make a motion to approve the agenda. Second. Thank you. And. At this point, do I have to go out to the public? I forget. Or, no. All right. So can we have a roll call vote? Vice Mayor Harrington? Aye. Councilmember Edwards? Yes. Councilmember Cook? Aye. Councilmember Henley? Aye. Mayor Agramonti? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going on to comments from the public. I've got my little microphone. At this time, members of the public may comment on, comment on any item not appearing on the agenda. It is recommended that you keep your comments to three minutes or less under state law unless otherwise permitted under the Ralph M. Brown Act. The merits of the matters presented under this item cannot be discussed or acted upon by the City Council at this time. For items appearing on the agenda, the public will be invited to make comments at the time the item comes before the City Council. Upon being acknowledged by the Mayor, please step to the podium and speak to the microphone. Begin by stating and spelling your name. And you are already there. Thank you. Uh, Christopher Welch, <coughs> W-E-L-C-H, 465 Claudia Drive. I'm the manager of Sonoma's Tuesday Night Market. I'm sure you guys all know that. I'm happy to be here and not on the agenda. Uh, I wanted to inform you about and invite you to our first annual Farmer's Market Funny Fest fundraiser this Saturday at Vintage House. Some people have been asking why would Sonoma's Tuesday Night Farmer's Market need a fundraiser, which caught us by surprise. We thank our sponsors every week for their generous support of the market, but it hadn't occurred to us that people may not know why we need donated funds to keep the market running successfully. Here's some things that our nonprofit organization, the Valley of the Moon Certified Farmers Market, provides to the community. We bring local farmers, craftspeople, and music to you every Tuesday, May through September, for 21 weeks. We double EBT food stamp funds that patrons spend at the market to encourage and help those of us less fortunate to get better and more quality produce. We keep farmer stall fees reasonable. Some people have asked why we don't charge more to the other non-farmer vendors in, to offset the cost. And we have raised and continue to raise our vendor stall fees in reasonable and responsible increments. Keeping the cost reasonable gives your clever and talented neighbors a chance to see if their business ideas will work at the market. And local music provides a night out for people to get together and enjoy the community they live in. And there are many other benefits. What we, don't prov what we provide, of course, doesn't come without a price tag. Whereas we used to just rent the horseshoe paved area around City Hall, we now rent the entire plaza, since it's clear that almost everyone in the plaza on Tuesday night is there because of the Tuesday night market. The City of Sonoma generously subsidizes a significant portion of our plaza rent, but rent and other costs to run the market continue to rise each year. For instance, due to more people downtown and in town on Tuesday nights, we also pay a significant fee to the police department for additional staffing on market nights. These are just two examples of the cost we incur to bring our community a safe, fun, and entertaining event each week. Like all businesses these days, all of our costs, these and others, continue to rise each year. 
So with everything that our community has been through with over the past several months, we thought a comedy show was just what everyone would appreciate. In addition to entertainment from three very funny nationally known comedians, we will be unveiling our newly designed 2018 market poster. You'll even be able to bid on the grand prize and first and second place prize winning original artworks from our poster art contest, along with other items. Many of our loyal and supportive vendors have also contributed items and gift certificates to be raffled off. So starting May 1, you will have your music and your market back every Tuesday night. You'll be able to get fresh produce for the week and see new and returning vendors carefully chosen by our selection committee. But before that all starts, I invite you to please come and don't miss this opportunity to be a part of the market's ongoing success and help us continue presenting one of the best and most well-loved farmers markets in California. Tickets are $20 and available through a link on our website at www.sonomaplazamarket.org. And thank you very much. I have some flyers here that I'd love to give to you. May I? Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Patricia Cullen in 425 Denmark Street. I was unable to be at the council meeting where you approved uh, a waiver of fees for the use of the plaza for um, the uh, Pueblo Day, and I'd like to thank you personally for doing that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patricia. Are there is there anyone else who would like to step forward and speak? Having none. <coughs> Let me see. I'd like to take a step back and ask the council if they have do they have any meeting dedications? None. Thank you. And now on to the I um, and we have no presentations. So on to consent calendar um, and let's see where are we okay. That's you. Okay. Thanks. All items listed on the consent calendar are considered to be routine and will be acted upon by single motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless members of the public, or I'm sorry, members of the council, staff, or public request specific items to be removed for separate action. At this, at this time, council may decide to change the order of the agenda. Is uh, of this council, is there any desire to change the order? Having none? At this point, I think, uh, do we have, we'll go for comments, no comments or questions, comments from the audience? Having that, boy, this is going to be good. We're all worn out, aren't we? <laughs> so I'm going to close the public co co public comments. This is what is the pleasure of the City Council? I'd like to make a motion to approve on the uh, consent counter 4.1, 4.2, 4.3, .4 and 4.4. I'll second that. May I have a roll call, please? Vice Mayor Harrington? Aye. Councilmember Edwards? Yes. Councilmember Cook? Aye. Councilmember Hunley? Aye. Mayor Agramonte? Aye. Thank you. Thank the you. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, the next item. The next item, we're moving into the uh, regular business. And the first item, 6.1, consideration, discussion, and possible action to authorize the application for certified local government grant application to create Sonoma Historic Train District. Good evening, Mayor Agramonte and members of the council. In June of 2016, a historic resource evaluation of the Masonavi Cottage suggested the possibility of creating a local historic district based on association with the train depot and the railroad tracks in the area of First Street East and First Street West. In November of 2016, the Design Review and Historic Preservation Commission express support for researching and establishing a historic train district intended to recognize and preserve a cluster of historic structures in northern Sonoma associated <coughs> with the North Pacific Railroad Company. And now, um, Rebecca, I see the map displayed on the computer, but I don't know if the public can see it. As indicated in the map before you this evening, the Municipal Code outlines a process for the Design Review and Historic Preservation Commission to recommend that the City Council designate an area as a local historic district. The City also received requests to fund this project from the Sonoma Valley Historical Society and the Sonoma League for Historic Preservation. 
The estimated cost of evaluating and forming a district is $15,000. $7,500 could potentially be funded through a grant from the State of California Historic Preservation. And this amount was included in this budget year cycle to allow for the submittal of a matching grant application to fund the consultant assistance necessary to research, document, and establish a district. The planning department is lead on this project, and it is a departmental goal for this year. As indicated on the map, it indicates a number of properties that are recommended to be included in the Sonoma Historic Train District based on the historic resource evaluation from the Mason Abbey Cottage. The consultant who's selected to prepare the district may make recommendations on additional properties to include or to remove from the district. <coughs> However, the final decision on which properties to include in the district will be made by the City Council. To implement the Council's budget allocation, staff prepared a certified local government grant application to create a Sonoma Historic Train District. This was reviewed by the Design Review and Historic Preservation Commission in April, and they unanimously voted to recommend that the City Council authorize the application. Thank you. Before we continue, I'm, uh, I don't know where the technician is, but I'm understanding at home people can't hear the meeting. Is there a white courtesy phone or something? <laughs> I don't know how we'd contact that person. <laughs> Thank you. It's our viewing audience. Nielsen ratings are going to go down. <laughs> Thank you so much. You can, if, you can continue. So that concludes um, the staff report. I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you. So are there any questions from our council? So I have a question. So the green um, that we have on here for parks, do we have a bigger map? Does that extend or is that just, does it end right there on the map or does it go to I think the green, Second Street East or does it? The green extends or? under the, um, the red hashing. So you can't see that Depot Park is a park. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions, comments? None? Then I'm going to take it out for public comments. Is there anyone here that would like to make a public comment? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Patricia Cullinan. Um, thank you very much for considering it. This is really an important part of Sonoma history. Uh, most of the history that is um, recognized as a district in Sonoma relates to Mexican and Spanish uh, settlement and the train district is early 20th century and slightly before. Um, I can't remember when the train came to the plaza but it was moved to Depot Park in 1890 and I hope that you all support this. It's, it's important to, the, to promote the history of our community as a bit broader than uh, people th typically think, and I think it's an important element for heritage tourism. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Robert Demler, 649 First Street West, Sonoma, registered voter in Sonoma. Uh, I always say that this year. Uh, I spoke about this at Patricia Cullinan's request at the design review, but I would have spoken f in favor of this anyway. I think this is a very fine and important step forward in our recognizing uh, on a broader level, a broader scope rather, the, the history of our wonderful town. And I also would like to say I hope that this is will not be the first one that we consider going forward 
after we have the, uh, the plaza area and the historic district and so forth because there are other possibilities, the Broadway area, the, uh, the area around Sebastiani Winery. It, to have these smaller historic districts within our city, and the city has grown from the center outward and, and continues, it would give a greater recognition to, to the general public and the citizens about what we have here and it may, just may, psychologically influence the neighbors to respect and to uh, consider carefully any changes they might consider to uh, structures within these many historic districts. So I want to thank the City Council for uh, considering this and urge you to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Demler. Less than three. Gina Kuklis, tonight I'm here um, on behalf of the Sonoma League for Historic Preservation. I chair the Civic Advocacy Committee at 1212 Alberca Road. Uh, just to say thank you, but it, uh, we wanted to acknowledge um, that you heard us. You know, it was roughly a year ago we sent a letter asking that it be included in your budget, uh, money to do the work, to do the study, to create the train district. So uh, thank you for that. And thank you for moving forward and anything we could do to continue to be a partner with the city to help make this happen and future historic districts happen. Well, you know where we are. Thank you. Thank you so much. <coughs> Claudia Ranneker, 300 Second Street East. Um, I'm in support of this district, this train district, simply because it shows... I have, uh, in my family, there was a very good relationship between the train and my family. My grandmother used to get, used to feed out in her front yard the train crew because they would give her water to do her laundry. They had a very great relationship and the train crew also gave my father, who grew up in that house, a book, a Christmas book that they signed. So the train crew, in relation to the people in the all along the track. I think they had a very good relationship and I'd like that to be supported in, uh, in our city to show that the train was a good thing after all. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Ranneker. Are there any other comments? Um, so I'm bringing, I'll close the public comment section and are, are there any questions from the staff that you hear that need to be answered? I didn't hear any myself. So I would like to bring this back to the city council for any comments or questions. And do you, I'm sorry. Sure, can I go? Pardon? Can I go? Yeah, oh. sure. Um, uh, I support this. I'm glad it's before us. And good job, Wendy. Um, and everybody else who worked on this. Um, just on the note of um, heritage tourism, I do think that um, the more we can do to promote our history gives people, our visitors and also locals, mm -hmm. another reason to come here, which is really wonderful that there's wine tasting and beautiful outdoors and bicycling and then all of our wonderful history. So that's um, exciting that that's happening. I, the only note I wanted to say is if this um, grant is not approved, I'd like to see the city appropriate the money so that we can go ahead and get the train district established because it's um, not that much and it would um, be a good thing for our city. Thank you. Uh, I will also be supporting this, and I think that Depot Park is our unsung uh, hero of a park, so I think that this will get, make a lot more people just curious about going back there. I remember the first time I came to Sonoma and saw the Depot Museum, and I was wondering why it was back there. And so I feel like this would help put it into context for all of our visitors. Um, I do think that there is a lot of rich history that perhaps people here have forgotten about or maybe they didn't learn about, but I'm excited to learn, and I agree. I think that uh, if we can't find um, free money to do it with, I think it's important enough that we make sure it happens anyway. Mr. Edwards? So with, with the great opportunity we have now with the Cheese Factory remodel being approved by the Planning Commission and that access to Depot Park that will be coming the negotiations with the state on the parking lot and I've always I've talked about it for years about um, I always called Depot Park the bastard stepchild of <laughs> the plaza and I love Depot Park and it's it's one of my favorite places and we've done a lot of work with Rotary and other things there but I also want to consider 
that we keep thinking about the, the old rail line all the way down to the green building on 121. And mm -hmm. our club, we, uh, uh, we cleaned up 8th Street a couple of weeks ago, about 1,500 pounds of trash. And there's people driving four-wheel drive trucks. It's not in the city limits, but they're driving four-wheel drive trucks up and down that road, building bigger ruts. And I think we need to, as a community in general, <laughs> not city of Sonoma, but valley general, um, demand from our supervisor that we get that thing finished. We have got a parking lot at the end of um, Napa Street that is just sitting there all blocked off. It's for bicycle park to park your bikes and ride up and down the bike trail that's supposed to be there Jan that Janet Nicholas promised way back when. Mm. And so I'm encouraged by this. Um, I think it'll be great. I think there'll be a lot of support from civic groups to continue to work with Depot Park and with the farmer's market that's there. I think it, it's just, it's a great opportunity. Um, and like Claudia talked about, um, there's lots of people that used to make raviolis for people that would come in on the train and produce was shipped back to San Francisco on the train by visitors that would come up. I think we had three train lines at one time that came into Sonoma, so. Um, pardon me? Yep. Anyhow. Um, so I'm going to support this tonight as well. Thank you. Thank you, David. <laughs> well, I want to thank staff and the committee, um, and especially Patricia Cullinan. Uh, I think she called me three years ago and was talking about this. And it's funny where time goes, but uh, I'm happy that we're moving forward. I will be supporting this. And uh, with the pleasure of the council, I'd like to make a, um, a motion. I'd like to make a motion to authorize a submittal of the attached certified local government grant application uh, to create Sonoma Historical Train District. I'll second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second, and would our city clerk do our <laughs> roll call? Vice Mayor Harrington? Aye. Councilmember Edwards? Yes. Councilmember Cook? Aye. Councilmember Henley? Aye. Mayor Agramonte? Aye. Thank, thank you. The you motion all. carries unanimously. And thank you, Patricia and others, for um, bringing this to our attention. This is a long awaited, I can't wait. Thank you. And just um, Mayor Gramonte and Council will keep Council apprised if and if for some reason we do not um, get the grant, then we'll come back to you and you can look at an augmentation allocation at that point. So I understand the sound is better now. So we're. <laughs> Are you ready to move forward? Yeah. We're moving to item 6.2, presentation and update on October fires, after action report, and current initiatives in process. Yes. Okay. Does that mean I'm up? Just a moment. Okay. Heck, I'm a, I can hear it. Sandra's <laughs> fault. All right. Well, good evening, Mayor Gramonte Council, members of the community. Um, your city staff is pleased to bring forward kind of report and an update about um, the Nuns fire and the fire that impacted our valley this October. Uh, <clears throat> the purpose of this is really to give you an overview, um, both from a fire department, fire district um, perspective, and also talk about the EOC's um, operations. And um, we also want to outline some of our findings from the after action. I think this is still a work in progress, and there's more work to be done here as we move forward. But there's also a lot of work that is in process. There's a lot of initiatives and, and efforts that have been done, and we want to provide an update to you. And we will be continuing to have conversations what we see coming out of this is basically taking this and starting to put together a work plan um, and there may be initial financial resources that are needed either for staff time or a contractor um, maybe some additional resources for equipment etc all of that is not all put together yet um, but uh, I think there's enough here that we wanted to update you and and have a first conversation so um, the way we'll work tonight is um, Battalion Chief Bob Norbaum will do the first presentation with Chief Aker probably chiming in doing a little bit of an overview and then Chief Sackett and myself will kind of give um, uh, and um, Wayne Weirich, our Development Services Director, will go through um, a second PowerPoint. Um, and then Colleen Ferguson, our Public Works Director, may chime in also with Chief Aker when we're talking about some of the current initiatives that have um, been working on post-fire. 
Um, I think just a few comments of, on overall if, um, as we start. As council's well aware, this was an immense fire, a multi-day multi event, and something that none of us expected to see or would want to see again. Um, as a city, we are extremely fortunate, as you also know, not to have any damage, but we played a role in supporting the Valley um, and uh, appreciative that we didn't have any damage. Um, definitely thankful for the talented and um, committed staff, fire and police, and the mutual aid folks that came in. They really were our cavalry when they arrived. Um, and uh, I'll never forget that when they first started to come into the EOC. And also the public was amazing, incredibly supportive um, of fire and police personnel, staff, just the, the, the amount of support that came out that people showed each other and neighbors um, was truly inspiring. Um, I also want to thank the council for their leadership and outreach during this process. Um, there was some really uh, great outreach and helpful communication that was done uh, during, uh, during the eight days. Uh, I guess overall, I also want to say that emergency preparedness takes dedication, um, funding, and really building a culture of commitment. And I think as we move forward, that's part of what we're hoping we can do. And again, tonight is not a final step. It's just a beginning step as we continue these conversations and try to move forward with our lessons learned and what we can continue to do together. So with this, that will turn it to um, uh, Bob to do an overview of the fire. Okay. Good evening, uh, council members, staff, and I guess the listening public. Are we, are we back to... Okay, good, because these slides aren't going to mean much if uh, I can't explain them. So tonight I have a little uh, slideshow to kind of uh, give you guys all, give everybody a background on this uh, incident. Um, why me? <laughs> I was the unfortunate one that was on duty that night, and I was dispatched to the uh, nuns fire in Glen Ellen. Um, and then I was subsequently uh, assigned to that for about two and a half weeks, so. I have some pretty good knowledge from the front lines and I want to share some of that um, with you all. But before I get into the fire, um, there are probably some folks out here in the community that don't really know what Sonoma Valley Fire is and how we're made up. So I just want to real quickly um, go over our organization first. And um, the city of Sonoma, I, I started with the city of Sonoma 28 years ago this month. And when I started, it was a single station on Broadway. We had an engine that was staffed most of the time and an ambulance there. Um, in 2002, we formed a JPA with the Valley of the Moon Fire District, our neighboring fire district. Um, so the city of Sonoma and Valley of the Moon um, merged. That's why our patches say 2002. And a few years back, about six years ago, we ended up um, all moving into the Valley of the Moon Fire District under one uh, employer. And now the city of Sonoma contracts for services with the Valley Moon Fire District. So we are your provider here for the city of Sonoma. And we also just recently um, started contracting in July for the Glen Ellen Fire District. Uh, we'll provide one engine company uh, staff there for them. And that actually uh, is where the Nuns Fire started. So let's see if this clicker works. Oh, thank you. I hope I turn it on. So. Um, the map in front of you there gives the location. The, the little flames there are actually our fire stations. So we operate out of six stations. Uh, four of them are staffed. So we have four staffed engine companies, uh, two ambulances, and a battalion chief daily. Uh, we also have uh, two stations that are staffed solely with volunteers. Um, we are a combination department. So we have about 75 or so personnel, give or take, um, with our volunteer and career staffing. So that makes up our organization. And as you can see by the, um, the map in front of you, um, the nuns fire definitely impacted our agency and, um, and our valley. Uh, just so in case you're wondering, that station there in Glen Ellen that's in the footprint of the map did not burn. So we did not lose a fire station uh, like they unfortunately did in Santa Rosa. So a couple things, to, a little background for our challenges. So. The major challenge was the weather. Uh, RH is relative humidity, and it was below 10% in, in the single digits. That's critical fire weather. We don't see that very much here, fortunately, in the valley. We did that night. Um, we also had some of the strongest winds that I've ever experienced in my, I've lived here all my life, and I've never experienced winds that, that were that strong. 
So what that meant is uh, with the relative humidity that low, the vegetation was extremely flammable, and when it did burn, it burnt very intensely. Couple that with a wind that was uh, phenomenal, and we've got the disaster that unfolded in front of us. Um, one of our other challenges, as most of you know, is the evacuation warnings and things like that. But what I want to clear up here is actually on the front lines, we did put out um, warnings. We did have uh, uh, areas of the Glen Ellen community that we asked to have evacuated. And somehow those communications didn't get to the community. I think largely because the phone lines were down early. Um, we we uh, were out of phones in uh, landlines in Glen Ellen and also uh, some cell towers were impacted by the fire early on. So the communications were very um, limited. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about evacuations uh, coming up because we did have um, some folks that were out there doing evacuations and uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go over that here shortly. Um, also, <laughs> one of our major um, challenges were the multiple fires throughout the region. Um, we're used to calling in the cavalry and the cavalry shows up, but when there were so many other fires that were occurring throughout the state, it made it very difficult uh, for us to, to gather resources here. We're, we're kind of on our own, which I can show you some of the statistics here um, that show that um, out of the 21 large fires, 18 of those fires were in Northern California. Um, very, uh, it was very imp a very large impact on the resources. And, you know, we've, we've had, we experienced a lot of fires in California. We've had some events where there were multiple fires, but we've never had any events where this much destruction occurred. These fires were in very heavily populated areas. And this was really unprecedented in the state of California. This, is, this was the worst uh, single fire siege in state history. And unfortunately, our valley was impacted in that. Um, it took 11,000 firefighters uh, to come together to take care of these fires in Northern California. And we ended up getting, I think, around 5,000 of those here eventually um, on the Nuns Fire. Um, this map kind of illustrates the three, of the three largest fires in these uh, Northern California, in this Northern California firestorm was uh, all located with, in Sonoma and Napa counties, the Atlas Fire, the Nuns Fire, and the Tubbs Fire. And those fires also, or if you see the little 10 mile marker there, that's all within 10 miles. They ended up being within 10 miles of each other. Um, something that was, you know, really significant, um, very challenging for us. Um, we, uh, we also already had um, a water tender committed to the Tubbs fire, because these or the uh, Atlas fire, these fires started before the fires here. So we're, we're, we in, are part of the master mutual aid system in California. We were called upon. We sent a water tender to the Atlas fire, and we sent uh, an engine to the Tubbs fire when it was still in Calistoga. And um, we still were able to uh, get pretty a lot of resources out of our department, which I'll, I'll show you the chart on that here in a minute. Um, what's not included on this map is actually the, another, the other fire called the 37 fire, which occurred on Highway 37. And it, it was a significant fire as well. I think it was 2,500 acres or, or something like that. And that, that fire um, didn't even make the map. So that's the kind of, um, the kind of event that this, that this was. So um, this next chart, has the most destructive fires in California history. Um, this chart goes back 100 years. Uh, the fire in Berkeley was 1923. Um, four of these fires all occurred the night of October 8th, morning of October 9th. Um, the Tubbs fire in Santa Rosa was the worst, most destructive fire in California history. And we fell on the chart at number six. And um, I would have never guessed uh, uh, in the state of California that Sonoma Valley would be in this chart, honestly. Um, so very significant uh, wind event that we had that night. Um, also the Atlas Fire and the Redwood Valley Fire, they, they both occurred. So four of the worst fires uh, in California history all occurred at the same time. 
<coughs> excuse me, and um, the uh, so the mutual aid was very tough to get. California, we have one of the most robust mutual aid systems in the in the country. I mean, we do this a lot. Uh, we pull resources together very quickly, and we have a lot of resources that get utilized around the state. Unfortunately, with the amount of fires that were going on, uh, this chart kind of represents what we got. Um, it's actually a little off. We, we actually had, so those are engines, the little orange dots are, the solid dots are engines. Um, the uh, hollow dots are how many were requested. So early on, <coughs> excuse me, um, in the first 12 hours, 70 fire engines were requested. The chart shows we got five from outside of the county. We actually got 10. Thank you very much for uh, San Francisco and Marin County Fire. They both came to our aid um, knowing that we needed help here. So those were our two out of county strike teams that were here in the first uh, 24 hours of this fire. Um, Cal Fire was able to send a few resources to us, but usually that chart would be filled with engines from Cal Fire and adjoining counties. But unfortunately, um, it wasn't. We had about 30 units, so I was assigned to the Nuns Fire. Um, the Adobe Fire started shortly after that. Uh, not on this chart are the Norbaum Fire and the uh, Partrick Fire. And they didn't do very well either. <laughs> their, their charts are similar to this one. So um, on the Nuns Fire, we had about 30 units assigned to that toll that night that we had to work with. And about half of those were from uh, Sonoma Valley Fire. We really were able to muster up. We had everything um, that we could possibly deploy we had out on these, on these fire lines. Um, this map is uh, Wednesday, October 11th. So this map was done Tuesday night and there were four different fires all converging into the valley. Um, unprecedented for us I don't think you know we we do a lot of training we know that that um, we live in a area that is susceptible to wildland fires and you know we've we've all kind of planned for one of them but we've never really planned for four fires all at once in this valley and that's something that I in my 30 years I never thought we'd experience we did so we did the best we could with it um, this, was, this map was done about 48 hours after, so they do the maps at night. They do IR flights and figure out where the fire lines are. So this map was basically done about 48 hours after the fire was started. And there was almost, there's almost 25,000, <coughs> excuse me, 25,000 acres here um, in, with all these fires combined. Um, <coughs> I got a few other notes here, sorry. So in these, myself, and another battalion chief, Spencer Andreas, um, we were both um, managing large sections of these fires. Fortunately, we have gone through the qualifications and training um, provided by the state to be able to manage these sections. And I think that really, really helped us um, keep this fire out of the valley. We both knew uh, where this fire was gonna do its most damage if it kept coming into the valley and our priorities were to keep this fire out of Boyce Hot Springs and the city of Sonoma. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> so um, we were very fortunate to have also Chief Aker and Chief Sackett, um, uh, their representation for us at the command post once it got established was really huge in getting us on the map. Uh, early on with the Atlas fire and the Tubbs fire, um, a lot of the focus was on those fires and some of the folks in the in the larger command staff. So when you have a large fire like this, um, these fires that we had, Cal Fire comes in and they are overall responsible to manage these fires. <clears throat> a lot of those folks are from out of the area. We were very fortunate to have some folks there that were from Sonoma that were in those management positions that grew up here. And they were very... Um, active as well as Chief Aker and Chief Sackett and getting kind of getting us on the map. Hey, you know, we got a fire here in Sonoma Valley as well. And those kind of things really um, helped us having the right folks in the right place. And we, we eventually did get some resources, but for the first four days, we were really on our own down here uh, in Sonoma. Us, the Shell Vista Fire District to the south and Kenwood Fire District to the north 
uh, did a lot of um, a lot of work and staffing for several days without you know without relief. We had guys on the line just continual um, to keep these these fires to help protect structures and keep these fires in check. Um, and it was great to always have that presence in the in the command center. I know the EOC here uh, is important to staff as well, but for having folks in uh, where the larger decisions are being made at the um, command post level was really key. Um, so in total, the nuns fire burnt 54,000. Actually, I think it was a little more than that. I keep seeing somewhere between 54 and 56,000, but it ended up being the largest fire in all of the fires in the Northern California firestorm of October. This one was the largest fire. It also took almost a month to contain. Um, so a little breakdown, uh, that's a little hard to see on the screen. I'm sorry, can you guys see that okay? Okay, great. A um, little breakdown on the damage that was done um, in the community of Glen Ellen, which is our, we, it says Sonoma Valley there, which is our responsibility to, to uh, staff that. Um, the most damage was done there. Um, geez, I can't even read it on this sheet. I just thought I could see it on the screen. I got it. Okay, so uh, a total of almost 900 structures in um, Sonoma Valley, complete burnt. 375 of those were in Glen Ellen. That took the most uh, toll here. Um, in Sonoma County, out of the 56,000 or 55,000 acres, 29,000 of those burnt in the valley between Eldridge, Kenwood, Mayacama, Shell Vista, and, and the Glen Ellen community. Um, pretty, pretty heavy loss. Um, fortunately, we're, we had two fatalities, and only two, I should say, not fortunately, but only two fatalities. Um, one of them was from a, uh, a firefighter that um, was killed coming down on the backside of the mountain, and another one was a citizen that didn't evacuate. So my point there is if you're told to evacuate, it's really, really important that you do. Um, Unfortunately, that person didn't heed the warnings, and um, and that that was what uh, ended up occurring. Okay, so for us, um, we fortunately we endorse technology, and um, we <laughs> have this app called Active Nine One One that actually is tied into our dispatch center. Um, it works out really well. It gives us the call location the reporting party, it gives us a lot of information on the call. The other thing that it does for us is it connects all of our members in our department uh, in one text. So I was able to early on compose a text to send to all the members of our department, uh, including one that was on vacation in Ireland, saying we have a major fire, we need all folks back, mandatory, um, as disaster service workers, um, our folks that are paid staff are when when we recall them mandatory they have to report back to duty so that's part of what goes along with being a disaster worker and we they did that and all almost all of our volunteers ended up coming back as well so it worked out really good for us um, our previous disasters here uh, the flood of New Year's Eve in 05 we ended up having to send folks back to the station and get on the phone and start making phone calls so fortunately uh, technology has really helped us in uh, this arena and it was uh, it was perfect all of our folks got back in and we ended up having uh, actually more folks than we had rigs to put them on so it worked out good we we threw everything that had tires on it out there we even had an engine that we had um, recently sold but the department hadn't picked it up yet so <laughs> we threw some hose on it and it went to work uh, and those are the kind of things that we did um, during this disaster to really um, engage in this event um, and all of our crews I can't say enough about um, the staff and the folks that came back in they uh, they gave their heart and soul to this event and you know we couldn't we couldn't send them home nobody nobody wanted to leave everybody stayed and and stayed engaged so we also had uh, some local contractors and I know um, uh, city manager Capriola kind of keyed in on that earlier about the uh, local folks that helped out and amazingly enough um, folks from the community brought bulldozers and 
uh, water trucks and things that really helped us. Um, we ended up uh, using some of them in some you know, areas that uh, weren't quite as dangerous as this, but um, this actually is a local uh, dozer operator. If you know Nels Derrickson, he's out there on the front lines, uh, not working for Cal Fire at the time, but he borrowed a, borrowed a bulldozer and put it to work. I mean, that's the kind of things that occurred in this event that are um, really phenomenal and key to our successes. Um, so this here is kind of some frontline videos and pictures that I put together for you, for you folks. Um, this is a video of our rescue. Um, they, they called me and said, there's no fire engines left. So what a rescue is, is not really designed to fight fire. It's designed to rescue people in specialized uh, situations if they're trapped in a trench or, and they said, that's all we got. And I said, all right, I need you to go out and evacuate people in front of this fire. And uh, that's exactly what they did. And this is uh, Warm Springs Road in Glen Ellen, if any of you guys um, wanna know actually where this was. And so these are the kind of things that initially in the first few hours, we, uh, we basically concentrated our efforts on evacuations. And um, it, we were very successful in doing that. Between us and uh, Chief Sackett's crew of law enforcement folks, um, those law enforcement folks really put themselves in harm's way as well. They don't have the safety gear and training and things that we do, but they were right out there in the front lines um, evacuating folks. and and the residents that were out there knocking on people's doors, um, getting them out of bed was, was very successful. I mean, this fire occurred in the middle of the night, everybody's sleeping. And we were so fortunate that um, there were no fatalities in, in the first 48 hours of this fire. And I, I credit that to the firefighters, law enforcement and the community. Um, something else that actually helped as well were our uh, dispatchers. Uh, lots of calls were getting sent into dispatch. Um, I think if you YouTube uh, Sonoma County 911 calls, you can hear some very interesting and panicked phone calls out there. Our dispatchers really did a heroic job in um, in giving those folks information, but they didn't they didn't have any training in the fire side. Our dispatchers in the fire. Um, in 911, nine our REDCOM dispatchers are all um, EMS trained and they give great instructions if you're having a heart attack or need CPR. But there wasn't a whole lot of training given to them on, on uh, what to do in a fire like this. So we now have uh, training being given to them. We've learned some lessons from this. That's one of them that we've, that we've learned is uh, to get them some, some training and, and more advanced um, knowledge of what to do. But that still did a great, they still did a great job. Um, so initially evacuations were our priority and once we were successful in getting folks out and knew that most of the residents had evacuated, our next priority was to defend structures and that's pretty much what we did for the next few days um, without a, a whole lot of resources uh, to engage on this uh, perimeter controls what we try and do right away as well and uh, there was a little bit of that going on, but there really wasn't enough resources to, to commit to that. So we, uh, we made a lot of good um, saves on, on structures. Uh, we prevented the fire from getting into the downtown Glen Ellen area. Um, the, the motel took a little damage downtown. I don't know if any folks know the fire actually got to that. But uh, other than that, um, the crews really did an excellent job in uh, keeping this fire out of the urbanized areas. And I know you don't like to hear that our community is urbanized, but in the fire world, when downtown Glen Ellen is considered urban. So we, we did a really good job of uh, keeping it into the hills and out of the urbanized areas. If, if it would have started um, going down through Glen Ellen, it would have uh, most likely continued like, co you know, kind of like co Coffee Park. I mean, once it starts going through the houses like that, it's really hard to stop. Um, this was a, a house the crew was assigned to protect. So these are the kind of conditions um, that are out there that they were facing. Um, pretty extreme fire conditions for for Sonoma Valley, for anywhere in the state, but for here, um, you know, I, I wouldn't expect to see this kind of fire behavior uh, for most normal events. 
So we, um, you know, we really came together between us and the law enforcement and, and, uh, and the rest of the uh, valley here in um, really keeping this fire uh, at l the destruction level that it was at. I mean, it, you know, it, it could have been a lot worse. And I think um, the uh, experiences that our folks had, um, I got to throw in there the fact that, you know, we, we do send a lot of units out uh, every summer. You'll hear Snow Valley fires at this fire or that fire. The, that is really, really what helped us prepare this for this emergency. Um, having our folks exposed to larger disaster, you know, disasters in other communities and other large disasters. Um, everybody knew what to do. Everybody was engaged. We didn't have anybody that, um, you know, didn't want to go out and do what they could at this event. And I really accredit that to the training and experience that they've gotten um, throughout the state on these other emergencies, myself included. Um, I was at the Valley Fire, which was actually worse than, more destructive than this fire. And I learned a lot of things there that I was able to bring back here. Um, unfortunately, having a fire in your own community, though, is much more devastating than one in someone else's. I can, I can tell you that. We saved uh, some homes and, and also some vehicles, <laughs> some classic cars there. Um, that's the church in downtown Glen Ellen. Uh, that's where we kind of stopped the fire to keep it out of downtown Glen Ellen. Um, that was up on Cavedale Road. Um, the thank yous and community support uh, from this fire is uh, second to none. I've gone to fires up and down the state and I've never seen the kind of uh, thank yous and community support and the food that was delivered to us on the fire lines. I mean, that really made a big difference, you know. Tired firefighters aren't good, but tired and hungry firefighters really aren't good. So a um, couple more slides to give you some of our, so kind of some of our successful things out there that, that actually, you know, went good. This, this one's for you, David. Uh, the, the vineyards, uh, honestly, the vineyards um, really, really helped us out, as you can see. Here, the, the disc uh, areas and the, they, they made great fire breaks. We actually took some of the uh, vineyards and, you know, took fire breaks off of the vineyards. Um, it, and it was very, um, it made a big difference for us. It was very helpful instead of trying to take out a whole bunch of vegetation, we didn't have to. Um, we utilized those, those fire breaks that were kind of already there. Um, this map, I'm going to blow it up a little bit for you here. Um, we used this map in the first two, what, three days, Chief, Polly? Two, three days. It was the only map we had um, of this incident, and we were giving it out to folks uh, from across the state, and they loved it, because it has, um, I'll go back one, it has pretty much all of the east side of the valley. Unfortunately, it didn't have downtown Glen Ellen in it, because that really wasn't on our radar as needing a pre-attack plan, but what this is, is it lists all the addresses, streets, roads, um, it gives folks that have never been here before a good idea of what kind of terrain they're in. It's also a topographic map. So, you know, when you blow it up, you can see where the clearings are. If you're looking at this in, a, uh, in light of needing to make um, fire breaks, right, you can kind of tell, well, there's some big open areas there. This is where I want to start. Um, we need more of these. So I think uh, Chief Aker is probably going to talk a little bit more about um, trying to get some more of these developed for other areas of the valley not just um, the east side uh, great resource worked out everybody loved them uh, another great resource was the tri-tip trolley and all the other food vendors actually i can't just single them out there were so many food vendors um, that came together um, the tri-tip trolley they parked themselves at the cal fire station in glen ellen and um, they were making us meals that were so good nobody wanted to go back to base camp and get meals so eventually a base camp was set up and uh, folks were, were eating uh, or feeding at uh, Santa Rosa Fairgrounds. Actually, it was Napa Fairgrounds first, and then it was Santa Rosa Fairgrounds. Nobody wanted to do that. They, they wanted these folks. Uh, they made great food. And I, I know a lot of the vendors uh, came together. A lot of the restaurants and vendors and, and such came together. And um, they actually you know, were, were coordinating with us. How many meals do you need tonight? How many meals do you need tomorrow? I mean, it was, it was so awesome. I've, I've never experience anything like that out on a strike team you know every, every once in a while you'll get uh starbucks or dunkin donuts or somebody to come park their van in base camp but nothing to the extent of what we had here 
Um, it was it was phenomenal. Um, so one of the other lessons that we learned uh, in, is the evacuations, and that was something I wanted to discuss a little bit more with you, folks. Um, you know, we uh, we put out warnings and. You know, if you didn't sign up for the Nixel or the SoCo Alert and those sort of things that we didn't, you know, really, um, the, the community really didn't know that. So what we're working on, and Chief Edgar and Chief Sackett are going to talk about a little bit more, but we're working on getting some better warnings out there. But here in our community, we, you know, we try to, in our fire, we try to get them out. Um, so don't think it wasn't on our radar. It just, they didn't, they didn't make it for some reason or another. Um, Something else that we need to get um, for all of our disaster service workers are photo IDs, and you folks probably need them as well, right, to get through the um, evacuation areas if you want to get to the EOC. Um, we, we need to work on that. A, a lot of our staff didn't have them with them, and, you know, we had folks coming from other counties. Uh, they're driving through uh, three or four different fires to get here. I heard some really good stories of folks having to go all the way out to the coast and around so so we learned that we need uh photo ids that's something we're going to be working on um we also learned that we need to get folks back into their ho homes a little sooner um a lot of that is out of our hands although chief sackett um myself and a and the chp commander really went and pushed hard and again that was uh due to the coordination of us uh, local folks here uh really pushing the incident to say hey we need to get these people back in their homes. This is, you know, the, once the disaster gets mitigated enough to where it's safe, um, it's okay to allow people back in the homes. There were a little pushback from, from other folks. Um, we did what we could here to get folks back in. I think a lot of it was uh, driven by the incident and having local, again, it goes back to having um, some local folks there uh, in these uh, decision-making meetings that really made a difference and I, I got to credit Chief Sackett for helping us out with that. Uh oh, I do. There's one more slide. Um, we also coordinated with um, some large animal rescue groups. Um, that was uh, another difficult thing for us. Um, folks that have large animals, I didn't realize how passionate people are about their horses and um, they're willing to die for their horses and uh, that was a little bit of a struggle for us, but we did have um, some teams that came in and helped us get uh, the horses evacuated. There was this uh, uh, evacuation for animals set up at the fairgrounds, and I know it got a little overloaded, so it might be something we need to look at also in our future planning of um, maybe somewhere closer to evacuate these large animals too. So, questions? City Council, do you have any questions or comments? So I had heard about, you know, the way the order, the, the order that the fires came out, and so we kind of came in at the back of the list, and it was a lot of local guys uh, for a long time. Was the, is going forward, how could we not? How could that not happen? Like, was, is there anything that we could do differently to be able to get more support in light of something also happening in a much bigger denser place since we're so little yeah go ahead thank you excellent question and uh, there are a number of things happening right now uh, that we hope uh, to be able to implement and um, be able to be in a better position uh, in future events um, one is uh, on kind of a kind of an operational area um, level counties from one county to the next is keeping a better um, real-time status of what available resources there are and instead of waiting for a, we're using a system that's a little bit antiquated and that works well when we need engines say 24 hours from now or two days from now to relieve another crew but when you need them right now or an hour from now, that system is a little bit slow to react. And so we're working right now, both on a countywide level as well as a state level to be able to be more responsive and in a quicker fashion um, and using real time. Uh, the other thing that this goes into is there is an initiative right now that's um, at the statewide level called the D-RISC, 
um, disaster readiness for safer communities. Um, and it is an initiative that uh, is proposing $100 million in annual funding um, that will address two components. One is uh, response and the other is preparation. Uh, it will allow for funding in order to pre-position strike teams of engines, uh, five engines and a leader, um, when there are expected weather events. Um, so there would be, in, in this type of an event going back, um, if this funding was in place and the system was in place, we would have had um, probably you know dozens, if not more, engines in place in Northern California ready to respond to these incidents. So it would have provided some depth of resources there. And then the other is to, um, and again, as Bob said, they're, they're a little bit, they're, they're not as noticeable, um, but they're a really critical point in everybody's um, ability to function, both the communities and ours in these events, and that's our dispatching systems. And our dispatching systems were absolutely overwhelmed, the same as the, the fire responders were on those nights. And so the de-risk initiative also is looking for, is proposing additional funding to beef up um, dispatching. Um, to be able to handle the amount of calls that come in from the community as well as to be able to process orders and direct uh, responders in, a t in as timely of a fashion as we can. You're welcome. Chief, do you think uh, like a letter of endorsement or something from our city council to maybe some senators or something that are sponsoring this bill might be of use or helpful? I believe that's something that we'll be considering. I guess my biggest question is um, I know driving, driving around and looking at most of the areas, and I know where a lot of these uh, vineyards are in different areas, that they actually cut fire breaks. Did they actually remove those back to nature, or is there a way that we could have kept those? Or, and I guess my question is are they all been replaced, or are, do we still have some of those fire roads um, still there? So what the incident does is they, after the fire has been contained, they start doing fire suppression repair, it's called, and they actually have <clears throat> usually like their hand crews and their equipment, dozers and excavators and things go back. And what they do is they kind of lay the brush back on the ground. They put in, you probably know what water bars are, right? So they put in water bars in the inclines and they kind of lay the brush back down into those um, areas, for, but th there's no natural vegetation that's replaced. So, um, you know, they don't stay there forever, but they are still there now, um, just, you know, covered with the vegetation that they took out. So they, they basically, uh, you know, bulldoze everything off to the side to create the fire break. And then um, if there is any vegetation, say the fire didn't burn it, they'll put it back over. But yeah, I guess my question is, is should there be thought in the future that some of these fire roads where they were put it should be a permanent install in certain areas especially when you look at protecting the city of sonoma and the reason i bring this up is because this seems like something that happens every 30 to 40 <laughs> years and i'm i'm sure that you know sad but true this will probably happen again yeah it does and, and unfortunately all of the, most of those fire breaks were put in on private property so there really isn't, you know, we can make recommendations, but they're on private property. But there is fire roads, like if you go to SDC, for instance, um, they maintain fire roads and fire breaks up in their uh, area because it's a state uh, state property. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Ed, Mr. So, Bob, um, uh, so seeing these pictures brings back a lot of emotion for me. Um, and of course, I think about the fire every day, but it's it's to to see it up close like this again is is um, uh, interesting. But w when I think about um, the natural breaks that the vineyards uh, provided, what kind of resources are needed? I, I know we don't have them in the city of Sonoma, but as far as water, water catchment, ponds, other opportunities from a firefighter's perspective that we that the state should be lobbied for. Um, I know. That a lot of farmers are told, and David, you can probably correct me if I'm wrong, but you can't really build as many ponds as you'd like to to catch water for vineyard operations and so on. Are there areas in our the perimeter of these fires that there could be opportunities in the future for water catchment that could provide 
help in firefighting where water trucks aren't. Um, water trucks, my understanding is they have to go find, to go down to the source to pick up more water and go back to the Yeah, fire. There, there could be. So we need to be able to get relatively close to the water source to be able to fill our trucks, uh, okay. either to be able to drive there or get within, you know, a couple hundred feet. Um, we can, you know, usually manage that. But, uh, again, a lot of this stuff is on private properties. You know, um, tank storage is good. We can utilize those. Um, the ponds and lakes can be utilized by helicopters, which is very mm -hmm. nice to have. And I think a lot of those areas were being, a lot of the ponds and, and uh, water catchments that were in the valley were being used by helicopters as well. So it would be helpful to but, have some storage tanks um, down the road. As David says, we're going to have these fires again. Um, mm -hmm. Water storage is always helpful. I can't, I can't say no. We, we need water to put out fires. So, yes, yeah, that is no, definitely I, helpful. I just want to get it out there just so yeah. that people can think about that. And, you know, people above our pay grade that can right. be thinking about that as well. Thank you. Um, so in terms of the resources that before the fire started here, the resources that you sent to help out the other fire, is there a is there anything that could have been done to anticipate that we would need our own resources or is there any thought about waiting or is it just like say la vie if that fire starts first we're going to do mutual aid so or? for sure there's always thought and we always backfill our uh stations and our and our folks that we send out um we actually ended ended up getting both of them back the next day they were both released and came back the next day i can't say they would have made a major difference but um, yes, it would have been nice to have them here, but part of the master mutual aid system in California, I mean, that's how it works. So, you know, we were, we were over in Napa, but Petaluma was over here helping us. We actually even had um, Santa Rosa before the Tubbs fire got there. Um, I had Santa Rosa engines in Glen Ellen, and if I didn't have some of the engines from Santa Rosa and Glen Ellen, we would have lost more structures. I mean, it was key. So, we kind of, we all work together. We're, we're you know, it's like neighbors helping neighbors. And that's why I say in California, we have some of the best, uh, we, we have the best mutual aid system in, in the country. And, you know, can we improve it? Yes. But it's hard to anticipate um, those things. But we know, you know, if we're going to get uh, some red flag warning winds like what we had, uh, we don't let very many resources go. I mean, that's, we're gonna we're gonna hold tight and maybe not send as much stuff as we normally would if if that weather event isn't forecast. Thanks. And, and also, in case you're wondering, anytime we send anything out other than right close by here in our own neck of the woods, when we send stuff out in other areas of the state, we get reimbursed for that. There's always um, there's always a reimbursement process that comes afterwards, so it doesn't cost the taxpayers here in the city of Sonoma to send a rig to L.A. For instance, Council Member Edwards. An another question that just popped in my head: how, how was the interaction with the private fire crews that showed up in different areas? <laughs> they weren't going to. Yeah, it was great. They weren't going to go home. You know, we we're not in the business of uh, allowing citizens to, you know, get in harm's way. But um, we ended up endorsing them and putting them into. Basically, we implemented them with our crews, right? So, um, as I said, that rescue that was out there that didn't have any water on it said, hey, there's a water truck at Madrone and 12, go grab it and then, you know, go do what you can to save this house. And, and they did that. And that's the kind of things that, you know, we don't normally do, but we did to, to mitigate this, this right. incident. Thank you. And they, they, and were, they were good. They, they really did a good job. Um, I just, I have one question. I know there were fire crews from the prisons. Is there anything that you can say about that? Uh, we need them. <laughs> they, uh, they do a, a wonderful job. They, um, they're the hand crews that that is the cal fire hand crews and there's uh dozens of dozens of them up and down the state um, they come in the big red buses um the cal fire buses and they have the orange jumpsuits on so we we know who they are we they work side by side with us and we are very used to working with them they come with their own correctional officers um <clears throat> brett can probably speak to that a little better than myself but they're very safe they're not um you know, any they, they have to have very low uh, low, risk. low risk. They're very low risk prisoners, and they enjoy doing. It. I mean, they they get out in the community and and go fight fire. And um, those folks know that if they leave, they're in trouble. If they do anything wrong, they're 
getting locked up and going to prison. So there's a very, very, you know, to the real prison, um, there's a very, very, they're very low risk. And again, we work with them uh, up and down the state and they are wonderful to have because they do a lot of the dirty work that we don't want to do. So I wanted to ask one question. It may not be related to the fire, but it's related to to residents and fires within their in their homes. You know, walking around Sonoma, different situations, a lot of people don't have their addresses on the house. So how do you actually, how does somebody actually find the home? I mean, I would, there are probably tech, technology that's available, but how, do, how we, does that we happen? Struggle, well, we struggle with that often. Um, yes, we do have uh, computers in our engines that are linked to the dispatch center. So, you know, we can kind of tell, uh, give, if we're given the correct address, we can kind of tell where it is, but sometimes there's units behind or sometimes the um, information we get is wrong. It's always, a, always a great idea to post your address, not only on your curb, but your house as well. And if you're not on a, you know, city street curb, if you're up a driveway, put an arrow which way your house is in a driveway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, because I, it's unbelievable how many people, and the curb is fine as long as you don't park in front exactly. of it. Exactly, we like it on the yeah. house. <laughs> and, uh, but I think it, there should be something that we should do possibly within this, our own city to, make, to ensure some incentive program or something to people do that. I know we have the groups that go around paint curbs. Right. But, um, Well, they're know, required just, to have the address posted when their house is constructed. But beyond that, you're because I, yes. I noticed on Fano so, and those so we try. there are on the garage doors and they're lit. Yeah, we try. I mean, when they're constructed, but down the road, um, they are. You're right. There are times that people don't keep their addresses uh, posted or don't keep the lights lit, and uh, it takes one emergency uh, and a for crew a not to show up at the front door for folks to be like, "Why didn't you?" Now, why did you go to the next house next door? Well, we thought that was, you know, where we were supposed to go. You didn't have your address, Mark. So um, we'd like to try and get that out. Good, good question. Yeah, thank you. Any, any other questions for the chief? Um, I guess I have some wondering about the staff and were there any, since this was, you know, one of the worst fires ever in California history. And just like Council Member Edwards said, it's emotional for us to even watch the videos now. Were there any learnings about like taking care of the staff or what to do after? For sure. Or? Yes. Um, actually, we looked, two of our firefighters actively that were on duty lost their homes. Um, and we have uh, some peer support groups within the fire service and actually the incident management team. And those folks were wonderful. They came out, they met with, they came here actually to our stations, met with our, uh, with our members and there's ongoing peer support. Cause you're right. This, this was very, um, emotional and tragic for a lot of folks, you know, and that, that is a, a very good question. And we, we do have that in place. If you asked that question, probably 10 or 12 years ago, uh, not so much, but we've been really uh, working on that in the last few years. I wonder if there's even like a community model that could be set up because very intense for you who are part of it and also intense like for the people in Glen Ellen and the people that live on Warm Springs how to have like an intense crisis and then it's like you know the back community meetings I, myself I, Brett and Chief Chief Sackett and Chief Aker have all attended these community meetings I think that is really beneficial for us and um, the community because um, those sort of things really get questions answered and People can, um, you know, discuss what what their concerns are. And I think that's really helped itself. But you're right; there there does there could be more. I think the county has um, some groups out there that are specifically targeting this fire and the mental health from the folks that were involved in this fire. So there is places that pe people can go. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chief. You're welcome. Thank you for your time and your service. You're welcome. Thanks. Great, thank you, Bob. All right, so we're gonna now shift to a second presentation and there's about four of us that are gonna tag team this a little bit. <clears throat> and just wait a minute, well. Can I fill this up again? Yep, please. So um, to answer your question uh, about 
kind of mental health services. So one of the things that we were very conscious about, um, not only our own staff, but right, the impact on the community. So when we would have these community meetings, we would bring out counselors from uh, Sonoma County Mental Health Services who would come out there and just be in the be in the crowd and you know beforehand in the meet and greets were introducing themselves and reaching out to the people making some contacts and you know we rely upon their expertise to know which neighbors to follow up with we had all the contact information when they came through so uh, and in, of course internally we've had as you know as Bob mentioned we, we had several debriefings um, matter of fact we just had a we're scheduling a six month kind of review um, for everybody who was there so um, it's an important aspect of of what we do to keep us healthy not only physically but mentally right so. does does it seem like that's effective with the staff like people are feeling pretty good about it is it is it working i guess yeah i mean i think that there's um different um people respond differently right i, I do believe cops and firefighters are uniquely um wired and to handle this kind of stuff which is why they probably attracted to these particular professions um so i i think that most of them um at least have the tools necessary to kind of get through it but it's important to realize that it's an ongoing thing as a matter of fact uh, there's a, a gal who lives in town here that we're working with um, who deals with kind of post-traumatic growth and really kind of you know becoming stronger when you come out of these types of, of events and so uh, she's been very helpful and um, like I said I think we're, we're moving in the right direction um, it's important we, we didn't we haven't got there yet we didn't integrate with the, the fire department and the debriefings and they and they didn't integrate with us we kind of stayed within our own banks but I think that really allowed cops and firefighters to maybe open up and be more receptive um, because they're within their own people so. okay before we next next presentation I did want to have Rebecca just give an update on the sound issue we we're having earlier so with the change in all of the media, there were some issues apparently with Comcast, um, but both our streaming system and um, SVTV or uh, SVTV's streaming system, they were both working and the sound was on throughout the entire time. Bob did let me know that since then um, Comcast has, their machine has unlocked and it's working. Good, thank you so much. Okay, so moving on to kind of a little stepping out through the from the fire and talking about some of the other items. Some of this I'm going to skip over a little bit because Bob's presentation covers some of the items, but um, clearly we had a number of fires that um, first day. And on that Sunday morning, um, we the fire, we, in addition to the fires, they actually closed three of the four main roads into Sonoma. So 121, 12, and 37 were closed. So we were definitely somewhat isolated and something I'd forgotten about until remembering. And obviously then the merger of the fires. The EOC was activated at uh, 3 a.m. Um, on that Monday morning and it was staffed by city staff but we were too small to operate 24 7 for eight days and we brought in some augmentation and some of this I think is some systems we need to put in place for the future so we brought in a group of um, active and retired fire and police pro professionals the North Bay incident management team five and six folks they came in about day three I want to say and really helped augment and that professional group that is constantly doing um, EOC management and incident management, and they were very, very helpful. Um, we also brought in <clears throat> two assistant city managers who have PIO experience from San Rafael, Nevada, and this, that was kind of a, a mutual aid assistance there. And then um, for the first two days, um, I think we, you know, every fire personnel was out on the fire, and so we didn't have someone with fire expertise in the EOC. And then I want to thank Chief Aker for reaching out to retired Chief Mark Freeman, who came back in and then worked for, I think, six days in the EOC, um, almost 24-7, and was really invaluable to provide that fire perspective and communicate um, back in. Um, the purpose of the EOC, which is located in the back of this building, is to try to provide that centralized location where um, we can uh, coordinate and respond and help support emergency response and within the EOC uh, these are um, city folks um, fire and police folks who this is not our normal job so we come in we take on these roles and there were really two roles for the city one was the emergency operations center to ensure and do what we could to protect the city and coordinate for the city but then we also a large with this fire it was really a focus on providing mutual aid support to the county 
Um, and within an EOC, there you have the incident commander or the EOC director, and then you've got operations, planning, logistics, and finance, and these are the different roles. Um, and there's, there's both state and national training that we go through, and this is an area to kind of do some, definitely do some enhanced training moving forward. Um, so in terms of some of the key objectives, we set objectives every, um, um, every period, looking forward 12 hours of what the focus was, and these were some of the objectives over the time. Obviously, providing uh, f mutual aid and support to the first responders, and then also a big piece was making sure we had the water system going, especially with the um, out on Thornsbury, and making sure we had water for that area because we provide water um, outside of the city limits. I want to thank Public Works there. Obviously, the evacuation centers, meals, volunteer coordination, public information, and then um, you know supporting the, uh, the shelters. Uh, so I'm going to have Brett maybe launch in here as well at any time. Um, but one of the first things that I want to say, um, it was probably about 4 o'clock in the morning or so when Brett and I were talking, and he was clear based on what was happening with Glen Ellen was we needed to open a shelter for the valley. And so um, without Red Cross available and active, the question was where. And with the Norbaum fire kind of right to the north, we didn't want to go with Vets Hall. And so the decision I made was to call the school district and see if they'd open the high school. Large facility, large parking lot in the middle of town away from things. And so um, my calls to the school district um, staff or media were like, okay, what do you need? And I think, that, I think it was open like by 5.30 or so in the morning. Um, so that really, and I can't thank the school district enough. I think you know the school personnel, they're, they know how to manage, they know how to organize, they know how to do these things, and they had resources and people. And we were really lucky to have the leadership and um, just talent of the school district personnel in the high school. And this was, it was at the high school, but there were principals and vice principals and staff that came in from all over the district to help support the shelter. And they ran that for seven days. And at the high, there were 365 folks in the shelter and 50 folks out in the cars. Um, and then through the EOC in coordination with the community, and again, the amount of volunteers that came from the town in terms of food and cots and blankets, um, folks felt very, very taken care of. And I know a number of you were there and were helping support folks, and that was really important. I don't know if there's anything you want to add there, Brett. No, I think, um, you know, opening shelters uh, became an obvious requirement for us. Um, when I was first initiated um, or notified of and I came in, I, as you all know, I live in Santa Rosa. And so <clears throat> right before midnight, I got woken up and began to kind of track the fires using, you know, cell phones and my own police radio. Uh, and I could, I had a hard time getting a handle on really where this fire was because it seemed like they were calling from all over the county. And then it come to find out that's because there was fires all over the county. Um, so I headed out to, to Sonoma to make sure I could get out here before any of the um, one to check it out, but make sure I wasn't going to be landlocked in Santa Rosa. And so uh, as I came through uh, Glen Allen, I knew there had been significant damages in, in Kenwood already, um, and that community had been evacuated. And when I came through Glen Allen, I saw the damage that was going through Glen Allen. So I was really trying to figure out how, uh, what impact the city of Sonoma had as my responsibility for, um, for police services here. So. Uh, came down, did a little tour of the city, and didn't really see a whole lot of damage or any real threat until I got down to Leveroni and, um, and Broadway, and that whole area was on fire, and I realized it was probably time to really start looking at opening up the EOC. But also, as I drove through, knowing that we'd evacuated already mandatorily um, Kenwood and Glen Allen, mo most of those people, because Highway 12 was closed down or because of a, just a creature of habit, they all ran down to Sonoma. And so their parking lots were full, people were milling around. Um, so I knew we had a significant kind of um, transient population that had been evacuated um, here in, this, in Sonoma. So we needed to figure out how to best serve them. And so that's where the discussions began to um, start really with um, you know, opening up a shelter here locally um, in coordination as best we could with, with the main county emergency operations center, um, which, um, is what was difficult and chaotic to get through to them uh, i'll admit that um, but when you see the size and magnitude what they were dealing with i'm not necessarily surprised um, and so once again sonoma did what sonoma does best 
um, which is come together as community and make decisions independently that's in the best interest of our community and ultimately I think we did a great job on serving at least um, that portion of the initially evacuated people by getting them into the school <laughs> so um, once we kind of get the school situated um, and we had been in communication with the staff at Sonoma Developmental Center um, and to figure out one what kind of risk they were really in and two what was their plan um, if they were needed to evacuate because um, it's important to remember um, even under these kind of situations they're a fully functional independent um, government entity right run by the state they got their own police their own fire they have their own administration so we really wanted to find out um, kind of what their plan was and, it, and, and without necessarily being disparaging they they were concerned that they didn't have enough staff to fully evacuate and so uh, we had some communication with the fire services about are we gonna be able to protect it and if so can they stay there because moving them was quite a challenge as we knew it was going to be uh, and ultimately um, from my understanding there was some um, unpredictable fire maneuver or um, movement and the decision was made to evacuate them made by their staff to evacuate them and they requested our assistance and so um, we knew we couldn't commingle them given their unique medical fragility um, with the um, evacuees at the high school so we decided to open up the vets hall um, specifically for evacuees of the SDC um, and that became a challenge because we didn't have enough unique type buses to get them moved appropriately and so um, the initial idea was to take them from SDC all the way to the vets and then drop them and then go back and get new uh, a new set <clears throat> and that trip was too long and so we ended up having to do a temporary stop at um, Altamira so we were dropping all those um, patients at Altamira those residents running back and getting some more out of the danger zone and bringing them up and dropping them again at Altamira and then transporting them over to um, the vets hall and so that quickly filled up and um, they have two different types of kind of populations there and so um, it was ultimately decided that they needed a second location um, we didn't have a lot of good options uh, again there's a lot of decisions that are being made you know quickly so we decided to um, make a second location for STC at Adele Harrison Middle School where we moved most of the um, the super medically fragile and non ambulatory down there so um, the overall from what I hear from the SDC people um, it, uh, you know a week didn't go by for the first three or four months when somebody from um, SDC whether the, whether it's a worker or a parent of one of the residents would not see somebody in Starbucks and just stop and thank them for what we had done to get those um, uh, patients out of there and those residents because um, um, quite a special group of people and they really needed to be cared for in a special way so So once folks were um, in the shelters, then there was coordination happening by both the county um, EOC to the state, some of which we, again, we were not necessarily even aware of. And then there was also conversation with some state folks who were here talking to city staff and talking with fire and police, and they were trying to figure out, was it safe to move folks back, um, where else to move them, how long they could stay, and so there was a lot of coordination and trying to figure out what was the right thing. Finally, it really, the decision, I think, came from the state and the county EOC to relocate folks to Dixon. Um, and so there were two nights in the city. And again, um, th their staff, SDC staff, really helped staff and take care of those shelters and did a phenomenal job. Um, but all the food there, specialty food, cots, um, specialty bed, there was a lot of resources that were coordinated out of the EOC and through the county um, in terms of trying to support um, those SDC residents. So it, it's frankly, a pr it's, uh, it, it, we're glad that we were able to help them and glad they were able and then took it resettled in place where they could be more, more stable. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, on the, the first night, um, and I don't want to speak uh, for Steve, but uh, on the first night, Steve and I met with their um, commanders or their management staff, and we felt very confident that they were in a safe position um, given what we knew of the fire at the time. Um, as day two rolled around, the fire um, changed a little bit, and I think our confidence um, became less 
uh, we were less confident that they were going to be in position, and especially we thought there was an impending, you know, advisory evacuation coming down um, in this area. So, um, you know, we just provided what we could in terms of our, you know, our best knowledge, um, and really um, kind of left it to them to decide what they wanted to do with their patients and their residents, and ultimately. Um, we did recommend if they're going to move them that they move them out of the area and not out of the area and not just move them down the street a little bit because um, we've already moved them once so um, and hopefully it worked out well and I think one of the lessons learned about shelters is we need to have a variety of sites that we can potentially use because we don't know what situation is going to occur um, and I think that's a future piece for us to kind of work on um, as you all know, um, the Sonoma Community Center, the city had a contract um, with them to manage our volunteer center. And I want to thank John Gurney for taking my call at whatever, 4.30 in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, and jumping in and saying, okay, I didn't know we had this contract, and really stepping forward. And it's good to have a prior police chief in charge of your community center. But they did a phenomenal job, stepped up and helped organize. And I'm not sure these numbers may be even a little low based on some recent numbers I heard from um, from John. But, you know, there were definitely over 400 folks that volunteered and assisted. Um, at one point when the community center became in the um, Voluntary Evacuation Center, then Banker Marin um, offered their location. So uh, there was a lot of really good work, and there's some lessons learned um, that um, Wayne's done a debrief with them and some things that we want to try to move forward uh, with the Volunteer Center. But it's super important to be able to have volunteers and, and have them help in a whole variety of ways. Brett, you want to talk about? So... Um so it's been said many times, and I, I, I can't reiterate it again, but um, this community came together, um, and they did what they do best around food. Um, they provided just unbelievable amount of food. Um, it was well organized. It was well received. Um, all the police mutual aid would come up here, and they were, like, just shocked. I mean, I kind of chuckle because I had never been on a mutual aid call anywhere else in the state, and you know, they kind of laugh that typically they get you know deployed up to you know somewhere and um, you know one is under different circumstances and so they're in full riot gear and people are yelling at them but here the people were super nice and polite and he says we're getting food I mean typically we get a power bar and a bottle of water and say hey good luck we'll see you in 12 hours and um, he says we're getting swordfish and saffron rice and <clears throat> but uh, the downside to that is, um, and Sandra, I love you to death, but um, man, you made me run a lot of miles afterwards when I gained all that weight. So, um, so we kind of, you know, tongue in cheek called the 10 pound fire. So, yeah, and I just want to, you know, I think I want to acknowledge um, Rotary's leadership here. There was a huge amount done by Rotary, um, and um, with the red grape and girl, girl in the fig kind of that first day really stepping forward and Gary helped connect some of that but then all the grocery stores so many restaurants hotels emptied out their kitchens I mean just you know the stories are amazing so really appreciative of the community support um, to make sure that folks were fed and taken care of so they could do their good work um, the city water crew, and you've heard a little bit about this before, but I really want to thank our water crew. Um, they worked in two-person, 12-hour shifts. We had 24-7 coverage, and we, as Murphy's Law, we had a couple of things happen with our tank out in Thornsbury, but they troubleshot all those things around and made sure that there was always water to supply those fire hydrants. And um, so this was another piece that was talked about. In addition, when the fire was on the east side starting to come, there was also concern about that we might need to evacuate the city corporation yard. So something else our public works crew was doing was doing an inventory, figuring out what to move. Um, and um, I think it was John Benward um, who helped provide his location that we could move the corp yard. And so the whole uh, major portions of the corp yard equipment were moved um, so that in case something went sideways, we weren't scrambling. And I want to thank um, Colleen Ferguson and her, her team for that um, good work and, again, strategic thinking and being ready. Um, some of the other partners, and you know, we may have even left some folks, but um, as we all know, General Vallejo was kind of a, uh, a pulse for all of us. But uh, we did have some assistance with Red Cross helping bring in some cots, et cetera. But 
Uh, I think the bottom line going forward is Red Cross is not able to staff shelters and will not be in the future. And so this is something we are going to have to figure out how to do as a community-based effort. Um, the Sonoma Valley Hospital also was, was helpful in a variety of ways, helping um, provide resources uh, for the shelters. We did a lot of translation with La Luz and coordination to try to help spread the word, and again, providing that mutual support of PIO outside, which is the city limits, and working with them to, to come forward. Obviously, Sonoma Raceway had their um, a temporary um, camp, I guess, for lack of a better word, that they hosted and supported. Um, pets Lifeline the first day, also we contacted them to help take care of pets and come over and help staff the, the general shelter, and they were really helpful. Um, also can't thank uh, Bob Taylor and his crew enough. Um, we were able a couple days into the fire to kind of get on top of some of the public information and provide some, really putting a face in these guys' faces on, on top of the fire. and and provide um, some more detailed information about the valley. And being able to have the EOC in this building and use this facility for those videos and the technology was just a great asset. And then in the future, um, once we had a CAL FIRE PIO on, on site, uh, we pushed him to do some focused Sonoma Valley um, PIO, something that they had not done, CAL FIRE had not done normally. They like everything centralized, um, but they pushed on it and after about 24 hours and got permission. And so Gabe, I forget his last name, it was our PIO, did um, a number of um, video updates that we then launched, and we also then worked with La Luz to get those translated. So I think we're really lucky to have this facility where we have this kind of capacity to be able to use, um, and it's something I think we need to strengthen going forward. Obviously, the Index Tribune was putting all kinds of good information out. The Native Sons helped with the shelters, and there were tons of other volunteers and donors, but those are just some of the key, some folks that, that assisted with the EOC outreach. And um, when she brought up La Luz, it made me think of another another thing. Um, as as Bob mentioned, um, in the morning, I would go up to Santa Rosa to base camp, and we'd have you know large briefings up there. Um, and it's important to remember he mentioned it earlier, but in the early stages of the fire, um, all the fire coordination was coming out of the Napa County Fairgrounds. It was being um, managed for a different Cal Fire team. So um, eventually, we were able to get it transferred to Santa Rosa, and so I was going up there and. About midweek, um, I was in a meeting, and it looked like um, we had some trigger points, and with the weather conditions, we thought that the springs may come in an area where they were going to be in jeopardy in terms of probably needing to issue an, an advisory ev evacuation. And I was concerned about um, the ability to communicate effectively with the Latino population um, and Spanish speakers. And so uh, I mentioned that just kind of offhand in a in a meeting, and one of the National Guard units says, well, how many Spanish speakers would you need? And I said, I'd love to have 20. And that was around 8 o'clock in the morning, and by noon, we had 20 Spanish-speaking um, National Guardsmen standing in our lobby who we partnered up with um, our deputies um, to go out there to provide the um, announcements over the loudspeaker in Spanish. Um, and so it kind of goes back to what Bob had said about um, the power of the California mutual aid system is pretty phenomenal. And um, I was shocked that they would even show up. As a matter of fact, it was a comment I said. I didn't even really expect they were going to be able to fulfill it. But yet to do it in three to four hours um, was quite impressive. Um, and I think it did a great job in terms of helping us communicate with a segment of our population that um, was so important to us to do so. <laughs> So in terms of public information, I think um, this is a place as a small city that was, was a challenge. Um, one, we don't have a full-time PIO. Uh, we were in the middle of updating our website. Um, our city clerk who assists with public information was out on medical leave as of that Friday, and our contractor was in Seattle. Um, and so it took, um, a, it took some time to kind of get things going, but um, there was a lot of work that ended up being done through the public information. And again, because our website was a little clunky, our old website, it was difficult to put things up and post. We ended up using Facebook as the way to push information out to not only, again, the city limits, but really trying to provide what we could to the valley because a lot of the county information initially was really focused north. So these are just some of the stats, but... Um, 
There were about 129 Facebook posts and they were viewed by 46,000 unique folks during that time period. Again, we coordinated with um, the local uh, radio TV stations. And again, I think the videos were really powerful and something that we should definitely be figuring out how do we continue and going forward. Uh, we definitely supported the town hall that was organized by Senator Dodd at Presswood and stream that live on Facebook. And then um, I wanna thank um, Proud City, who was our web, website provider, um, and then um, both uh, Rebecca and Lori Decker, and then the ACM from um, San Rafael helped us take our website that wasn't, it was sitting at like 90% and we rolled it rolled it like two days later after the fire so we had could have a fire recovery page and we could have a different kind of communication template with our community that we really hadn't had before. So um, I think there's some things to learn. We did not use Nextdoor in this public information. Um, there is an ability for the city to have a Nextdoor kind of emergency only uh, communication and I think that's something we wanna explore. Um, yeah, so I think there's, and then having some depth of resources, maybe some other contracts and some assistance there. Uh, Bob went through this part here, so I'll um, skip this slide because he already kind of talked through some of the, the actual impacts to the valley. So uh, some of the key successes um, in terms of the EOC, it operated effectively with the staffing augmentation technology and the communication systems, and I think we were really lucky to have a great facility with, we had just invested in new laptops and I wanna thank Wayne Weirich for his work on all the technology and phones and so we we're able to walk in turnkey and start and that's really, while it feels like it's a luxury, it's really a mandatory um, and I think that really speaks to the city's investment um, some time ago. Uh, we've talked about the public information and the shelters and the community support. I think one other key piece that I think was really important Having the having uh, both Brett be the our police chief and then also the lieutenant for the county and for most of the valley created that kind of one law enforcement governance versus a chief here and then a chief for the for the unincorporated area it could have caused it it creates more communication challenges and the same thing with the um, Sonoma Valley Fire and Rescue Authority having Chief Aker being the chief of both the city and in the incorporated area, it created that kind of seamlessness. And so that governance structure, which takes time to put in place, um, as we've talked to some other of our colleagues in other areas of the county, I think this governance structure helped us respond more fluidly um, and have less, less issues. We've talked about public works, and I think one other piece is, it's probably completely hidden, but SFRA, not only were they responding to the fire, but they continued to provide basic medical response within the city's incorporated area and their district boundary. So uh, that is kind of an, a hidden story, but also something that is, uh, that's impressive. So we'll go to now to reimbursement and after action, um, and I'm gonna ask, um, Sue Casey, our assistant city manager, to talk about the FEMA reimbursement. And uh, Steve Aker, Chief Aker can also add on, this has been quite a process. Um, so after the fire, the finance part, kicks into place and um, uh, normally um, FEMA will reimburse up to 75% of the eligible expenses and then Cal OES reimburses up to 25 of the remaining eligible expenses and um, but due to the president's declaration of a national disaster for the October fires FEMA granted a 30-day window where they would um, uh, reimburse 100% of all eligible expenses. However, um, when you submit claims to FEMA, it's, it's, it's a very cumbersome process. <laughs> and we, um, the city was very fortunate to find um, a disaster recovery specialist who came in and she has spent a number of lots and lots of hours of getting all the reimbursable expenses, copies of invoices, putting it in the right format for FEMA, and then they come back and say, oh no, that's not eligible, we need this more documentation. And so 
um, she's probably spent over uh, 120 hours. Um, the good thing about that is um, all those hours are reimbursable by FEMA. So, and the only expenses that are not reimbursable by FEMA are any um, travel expenses. And she kept that to a minimum for us. She actually came from Las Vegas, but she um, really tried to keep all those expenses down. And so um, those are the only expenses for her that are not reimbursable, and that's about $4,000. So all of the um, other expenses, um, it's about $95,000 to date. And um, again, we were very fortunate because there was really no damage within the city, but we had a lot of, of, of other claims that, and the county is reimburses, reimbursing us for our costs for the shelters, which was minimal, it was about $4,000, and they're actually gonna be um, reimbursing us that, that right away, so we can actually, they're gonna um, uh, get that from FEMA and we'll be reimbursed for that. Um, so the only, um, and then the only other expenses, um, there was a, um, uh, engineering consulting cost to file mitigation work for soil erosions and on the burn slopes of, um, up the hill here and, and, um, FEMA said those were not eligible for reimbursement. And then of course there was the, um, small cost for the, uh, disaster recovery specialists or travel time. And then I, I'm not really sure that you could call it um, cost because the county is, um, they charge us extra for um, fleet services, but they, um, it, it was, I, we, we tried to maybe see if those would be reimbursable, um, but um, FEMA said it was not reimbursable. The amount of time that it would take to, to get all the um, backup documentation for that just wasn't worth it. So um, those costs were not reimbursable. I think we also want to thank um, kind of Sonoma County because there is, while well, since the city really's focus was providing mutual aid support, there's a variety of things that they've done. So all the shelter costs, the school district that we originally thought we might have to pay the school district, those all were taken care of by Sonoma County or being put in by the FEMA reimbursement. And so the school district will be paid by Sonoma County and then Sonoma County will get reimbursed by FEMA. Um, you know, one of the big pieces was um, the sheriff um, and and Brett's uh, and the conversation there to basically for the time period during the fire and right after the fire where the focus really was focused on the valley in terms of evacuation and all and then repopulating the city. They, they did not charge the city for that time and including some of that administrative time. And so it looks like that reduced kind of the city's budget by about 440000 um, and then I'll let Chief Sackett talk about um, kind of again the amount of funding that um, the reimbursement costs that we were able to um, get through uh, the fire. Thank you, Kathy. Um, so uh, on the fire side of things, um, for the most part, our experience here in the master mutual aid system um, really helped streamline things for the vast majority of our expenses and getting reimbursed. Um, as, as Chief Norbaum mentioned in, in his uh, presentation, we're a very regular participant um, in the mutual aid system and we're very familiar with going through the system of putting in for costs and getting reimbursed in a very timely fashion. Um, and through this incident, uh, the fire incidents in October was no exception to this. And we were um, assisted by uh, our local CAL FIRE units um, who uh, helped to streamline that process and make sure that we were, we were taken care of. Um, we also have one of our battalion chiefs, uh, Spencer Andreas, uh, spent time, uh, one of his many hats that he wore during um, the October fires, he actually spent time at the incident um, assigned to the uh, finance section and his expertise in there helped really to um, make sure that we got a timely and complete reimbursement for all of our costs. So that's a long introduction to say that um, we were reimbursed for all of our personnel, uh, both straight and overtime as a result of the incident. Um, we were reimbursed for our engine and equipment costs, uh, fuel costs, um, our fuel station at, um, at the Almaza fire station was uh, one of the only gas and diesel um, pumps available for the first couple of days of the incident. And so we utilize that not only for our um, purposes, but also we 
utilized it for our mutual aid partners and law enforcement and other fire resources. So all those fuel costs were uh, reimbursed by the incident, um, as well as our administrative and uh, workers' compensation costs that are associated with, um, with our response. All of that was covered by the incident. Um, the total reimbursed uh, to the SVFRA related to the October fires is $822,332. So um, very big, large amount. Um, and a as a result of that, um, you know, there won't, there won't be any additional um, asks for either the city or the Valley of the Moon District to contribute to um, any additional funds to our budget for this year. Um, lastly, and this would, this is the one little um, hiccup in all of this, is um, echoing on um, <laughs> Sue's experience with FEMA. Uh, we, we also, doing our due diligence, uh, tried to work with FEMA to seek some, re some additional reimbursements that weren't completely covered by the incident. Um, but uh, that has been an extremely frustrating and difficult process to try to try to get that. So we're still trying to work our way through it. But um, as you can see there, the dollar amount um, is very minimal compared to what we have been reimbursed. Uh, we're looking at just a little bit over fifteen thousand dollars that we're still still trying to go through the process. So overall, about one point three million in costs, and now we'll turn to Wayne, who's going to kind of go through some of the after action. And again, our thought is, <clears throat> as we there may be other things that aren't included here too that can be augmented, and that this kind of this ends up being kind of a work plan as we move forward. And I, I want to thank Wayne's leadership. Uh, Wayne was the alternate EOC director, and then also Wayne um, drafted the initial after action and pulled together the debriefs. Thank you, Madam Mayor and uh, members of the council. Uh, the purpose of the after action report is really to identify uh, the lessons learned um, and to form the basis for the development of a work plan uh, for moving forward. Uh, the following few slides that we have uh, here today identify some of those action items that we have identified for the work plan. And it's not a complete list by any stretch of the imagination. What ends up happening is that once you start working on action items, you find other action items that need to be worked on as well. So the list grows and it becomes, um, actually this, there's a lot of work to do under, um, in terms of what we've identified in your uh, staff report as action items and it's gonna take a lot of staff time and resources to get um, you know, all of those items uh, implemented. Hey Wayne, just, um, you're a little taller, but can you try to speak into the mic a little bit? Cause sure. so that's helpful, thank you. So uh, with respect to uh, emergency notification, we identified the need to uh, continue to work with Sonoma County on establishing the most uh, efficient uh, evacuation notification procedures and systems. So I know the county has been looking at this and, and we'll be in contact with Brett to make sure that we uh, um, uh, communicate with them to, to figure out those best systems. Uh, we'll also want to work with the county EOC and law enforcement to help educate the uh, public on evacuation uh, terminology and road closure information and how that information is disseminated. Um, as Bob uh, mentioned, the city's emergency plan should uh, be updated to include policies and procedures for access by authorized personnel. Uh, through road closure and evacuation zones. So we're working on identification processes to uh, allow that to occur. Um, in terms of EOC management and governance, and this has already been alluded to, um, uh, we wanna explore ways on how the city and county could combine city and valley specific EOC operations within the city EOC to better serve the entire Sonoma Valley. So. We've already um, opened up that discussion with the county and, and uh, there's a lot of talking that needs to occur and obviously a lot of different agencies that need to be a part of that discussion. Uh, but we think that it would serve the whole valley better to, to uh, have uh, sort of a branch EOC, if you will, for the valley uh, located in this location. Um, 
we want to identify and prepare prearranged agreements with vendors and partners for food, shelter, supplies, equipment, um, and augmented temporary staffing for EOC management and uh, public information. Uh, those uh, agreements should be in place ahead of time where we can identify and make it make use of them uh, so that we don't have to uh, scramble at the time of an, of a, of an event. Um, in terms of training, um, we want to provide training for city staff on the National Incident uh, Management System and the California Standardized Emergency Management System known as uh, NIMS and SIMS. Um, it's important for our city staff to understand how the structure in terms of EOC management uh, works and to make sure that we have uh, people backing up our, our, our uh, management staff that has gone through some of this training so that uh, we can manage these long-term events. Um, and we need to ensure that we have proper identification. Again, Bob mentioned that uh, uh, whether it's IDs, um, uh, vests, uh, other identification method methods for our staff and uh, emergency response workers so that they can get to where they need to be. Um, one item that we we got so involved at the EOC with managing the event that we sort of forgot about the regular business at City Hall, and so we needed we identified the need to do a better job communicating with those folks because they're also communicating with the community and making sure that the regular business operations are are working properly and that they are getting fed the information that they need. Uh, we definitely need to develop a plan for dealing with material and uh, food donations um, so that uh, we can have a system in, in place to manage those activities. Rotary played a, a large part in that in this event and uh, was very helpful, uh, but it's not something that we had specifically um, identified in our emergency operations plan that we, we should update. We also want to increase uh, training exercises and information for our key community partners as well as elected officials so that um, uh, we have a good understanding overall, a broad understanding of how we're going to react to these events. And we want to seek opportunities to collaborate with the Sonoma, with Sonoma County and other cities to share training resources. Uh, if we had to go out and develop all of this training on our own, it wouldn't uh, be very cost of effective or efficient. So we want to try to uh, draw on the resources that are out there and partner with those folks so that we can um, combine those training opportunities. Uh, in terms of local shelter management, and uh, volunteers, uh, we, we felt like we needed to develop a shelter management plan and guidelines, and Kathy alluded to this, that incorporates local shelter facilitation and management and doesn't solely rely on Red Cross as the, um, the sole provider of those activities. Currently, our emergency plan uh, seeks uh, out Red Cross to help us uh, manage those types of uh, shelters and and at this point we're we, we realize that that's not going to be the case moving forward and we need to to elaborate on on that and develop a plan ourselves uh, we need to work with health agencies to identify appropriate support resources for medically fragile residents and evacuees in the shelters um, you know Brent discussed that um, what we were faced with and uh, we clearly need to incorporate uh, that into our, our uh, emergency operation plan. We also need to identify uh, and develop protocols on how medical professionals are identified and verified at the shelter so that uh, we, the shelter folks know that uh, the, the people that are providing medical uh, help are appropriately trained for that purpose. Um, Kathy mentioned we're going to continue to work with the Sonoma Community Center to enhance the volunteer center coordination. There were a number of things that John Gurney um, identified in his after action report th uh, that he felt like they, they could work on and we want to uh, keep in close communication with the community center to actually uh, implement those. And uh, 
the food's been talked about a lot tonight, but uh, we do need to develop a food plan that identifies the su uh, food suppliers, the food preparation vendors, the food delivery resources, and prepare uh, prearranged agreements with uh, those sources so that we have those in place and we can go right to them in the case of uh, a disaster. As we start looking at um, public information and communications, um, we identified the need for outside public information resources, uh, and we want to develop those agreements for PIO assistance during an, a disaster. And we also uh, felt that there was a need to review and update the public outreach planning um, in our emergency operations plan to include social media and other types of newer technology that are uh, where it's appropriate. Uh, in terms of uh, communications uh, at the county level, we want to investigate uh, joint communications uh, training uh, with the county EOC and the city EOC staff so that we um, provide better channels of communication between the two uh, uh, emergency functions. And we also want to explore the possibility of having a Sonoma County liaison embedded in the city EOC to enhance communications between the city EOC and the county EOC. We, uh, we did that uh, during this event and it worked out quite well. Uh, having a county uh, person, staff member in the city EOC, uh, they were able to address um, a number of, of issues related to the county that uh, we wouldn't have had any um, other knowledge of. And then um, the school identified as they were uh, running their shelter operation the need to uh, have uh, mobile internet operations or options available to them. Uh, the school district's uh, internet service was down um, at, during the uh, event, and it would have been uh, much uh, very helpful to have internet service. So we ended up uh, uh, establishing a mobile service for them so that they had some internet service. I think it was day two or three of the event. Uh, in terms of hospital and medical community um, EOC communications, uh, we want to increase the training and coordination and communication with the Sonoma Valley Hospital and the Sonoma Valley Community Health Center. We also, um, obviously, and, and again, um, Kathy mentioned this, is that we need to develop um, uh, the prearranged disaster response agreements uh, so that we have those in place, have them reviewed by the Disaster Council, and have them make recommendations for the, uh, to the City Council in terms of uh, approving those agreements. There's a number of other items that uh, are, are um, listed on the uh, slide uh, that, that's in front of you. I just want to touch on a couple of them. One is that we definitely want to investigate the best methods for contacting employees for emergency call out. Uh, Bob mentioned a system that the fire department utilizes and that may, may be an option um, to have a similar system for uh, city employee call outs. Um, we want to make sure we uh, get our emergency resource contact lists updated and we also want to investigate potential backup EOC locations that are outside of the city limits in case something happens where this facility wouldn't be available to us for some reason. Uh, with that, I think I'll turn it over to Chief Aker. I think he's going to provide us some post-fire activity items. Thanks. Thank you, Wayne. Before we jump there, because we've got one other slide here, I mean, council knows you all had subcommittees, but I think it's important for anyone watching that council did a lot of work coming out of the fire and, and on appreciation, recognition, housing, um, nonprofit fundraising. We had liaisons and we had subcommittees, and we came together in November um, with a very special event um, in conjunction with the lighting of the plaza. Uh, there's been a lot of work done by Public Works to monitor the winter storms and obviously the FEMA process and the after action. I think one question that we've been trying to figure out is, you know, the economic impact to us as a city, was this a dip or was it a bounce? Um, 
And so we're still kind of waiting, looking for some information coming from the chamber. They did a, a survey um, and be interesting to see there. Our TOT, the city was down on our revenue on our TOT for the month of October, about 215,000. But November, December, we were only about 20,000 down in, in November and December and January have come back. Um, we're kind of back where we were. So for that, for me, that feels like it's kind of, it was a bounce. Um, sales tax, we've just gotten some information and are trying to absorb that and we'll provide council some um, um, update there shortly. And then on property tax, um, there is about a, f all the property tax loss gets shared countywide for the first year. As council knows, there's about a $55,000 reduction. Um, and um, then it will go to those specific agencies that's supposed to be filled by um, the governor's state budget. So hopefully that will be backfilled. But overall, because we've had, there was, frankly, because of the sheriff savings and not being charging us some of this, the re reduction in revenue to our budget is, frankly, going to be okay based on also reduction in some expenses. So. Those are, um, you know, I think it's still a little bit of a wait and see, but we're hoping we are in a, a kind of a bounce and that we're not in a long-term dip um, from the fire. Um, but uh, there's still some businesses out there suffering, especially more up valley. But it feels like folks are starting to return and there's um, and shop and, and uh, enjoy our town. So I'll turn it now to Steve to kind of talk through some of the key things. And this is also an attachment to your, in your, um, uh, staff report, so he won't go through all the items, but some of the key items that are being talked about. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so while you have the the full list in your um, staff report in your packet, um, I don't want to I don't want to put anybody to sleep too soon here. So I'm going to hit a couple of highlights. Um, in general, I think um, the the overall message that I want to convey to both the council as well as the community is that um, while there may not be really big noticeable um, accomplishments right now in terms of what we're doing, I, I want to assure everybody that there's a lot of work being done in a lot of different areas um, in terms of emergency preparedness, fire prevention, um, our operations, which includes response, as well as um, just looking to the future on how we can provide better service to the community, both day to day as well as in a, in a disaster. Um, so a couple of things I wanna hit on in, in terms of emergency preparedness, we're, we're focusing a lot on public education. Uh, we've updated our scope uh, program, which gets out into the communities and educates educate citizens about being prepared for emergencies. We've updated that to include a little bit more on wildfire evacuations and how to get in touch with your neighbors. And, and because as Bob mentioned in that, in our experience, that network of re neighbors relying on neighbors really was effective in terms of um, our very minimal loss of life on that first, first night and two. Um, and we're, we're actively engaged with community groups like the Glen Ellen Forum, uh, working on disaster and emergency preparedness and community preparedness. Um, also very important, and I know Chief Sackett uh, and law enforcement is working as well with this, but uh, right from the very beginning of uh, the incident, as soon as uh, we were engaged at, at the command post, we we started that engagement with county, state, and federal officials um, about community warning systems and response systems to um, make sure that we got adequate resources here, and then we had the ability to focus on improvements to the systems, how we can, how we can build community warning systems that reach more of the population, that are redundant and reliable. I mean, as Bob mentioned, all of our communications were down in the Glen Ellen and Kenwood area for days. Um, which which really stands to, you know, hopefully be an area of improvement. Um, next area I wanted to highlight briefly is uh, fire prevention. A um, couple of big big topics within that. One is vegetation management or fuel management. Um, fire fire departments working with city staff, um, public works. Um, Open Space District and the Sonoma Ecology Center to work on a uh, fuel reduction or vegetation management plan for the Montini Preserve Overlook Trail and that whole area um, north of the city. Uh, we're also partnering with 
the county uh, fire safe council groups as well as cal fire to get out into the hardest hit and most vulnerable communities to provide defensible space inspections um, and information about how homeowners can help themselves to be better prepared for the next time uh, in terms of response and operations there's a lot going on here um, Myself and Battalion Chief Andreas are both actively involved in our dispatch and communications um, center, REDCOM. Uh, we're looking at bringing in um, wildfire evacuation protocols as well as um, fire response protocols. Um, everybody's familiar with the emergency medical dispatching where they go through a flow chart. They can the dispatchers can provide bystanders with CPR instructions prior to our arrival. There's never been a system that's been adopted here for fire protocols. How do we advise bystanders what to do when something's on fire? So uh, we've, we've implemented that, we've, we've purchased that system and are in the process of implementing that. Um, as I mentioned, the de-risk initiative is one that we're uh, very much behind in advocating for. Uh, we've also uh, initiated a number of trainings um, you know the experience in the training cannot be overstated in terms of its importance in, in this event and, and in an ongoing fashion um, and we've we've taken the lead on offering a number of important uh, training courses that will further prepare our folks to be able to respond we're also um, continuing our efforts one of the big things that paid off for us as um, as Bob mentioned, you know, the first four or five days, we were, we were here by ourselves as a community, as fire service agencies, as law enforcement agencies, and we really, we really did a phenomenal job um, through the dedication and commitment of a lot of people. Um, and we're continuing that coordination with uh, the other fire departments here in the valley as well as in the county. Um, those relationships and those, that coordination that we built ahead of time, that, that benefit can't be overstated. Uh, things with like Shell Vista and Kenwood, Eldridge, Cal Fire, and Maya um, those really paid off, and we're continuing that. Uh, last thing on operations is uh, I'm a member of the Fire Service Advisory Council, which is looking at countywide fire services and how we make the appropriate investments in fire service to provide um, the best, most reasonable level of service throughout the county. Uh, for the sustainable future. And last thing uh, on the administrative side, you know, all of this is, um, all of this is a lot of work. It's a lot of people hours and um, our agency is a very uh, busy, complex agency on a day-to-day -day basis and adding this um, has added a lot of workload. So we've, we're looking at, we've looked at creative ways to add, by utilizing some of our one-time funds to bring on some additional um, staff capacity to address some of these additional um, the additional workload that, that is very critical for us to accomplish. Thank you, Steve. Um, so just in summary, you know, clearly we were very lucky, um, though we did have impacts in the valley, and I think has been said a couple times. This valley comes together, the people come together in a way that is truly inspirational. Um, I really wanna thank Chief Aker and Chief Sackett. I think we were really lucky to have two phenomenal chiefs help lead us through this um, and their teams. Um, and I also wanna thank city staff who worked super hard. Um, so in terms of, you know, as we move forward, um, we are resilient and we're going to continue to learn and grow and improve and move forward together. So uh, we've got more work to do uh, and be happy to answer any further questions or counsel. Uh, so thank you for all of that. Um, in some ways uh, it's crazy that six months have flown by but then in other ways it kind of feels like this distant dream that we had uh, but this definitely brings it back. So looking at the after action list, uh, which, you know, I, I'm impressed with this list because it, uh, I think, includes almost all, if not all, of the, the things that I had identified about us needing to uh, work on, particularly as we knew our communication, which was uh, something we want to improve anyway as a city, but particularly in those first 
few days before we, uh, you know, got centered enough and had enough people in the EOC to, um, you know, get get a, get some control in the situation. I know that there were a lot of very concerned people in the community and a lot of very frustrated people, and especially today when information is shared instantly by anybody, it just it makes it even more obvious when you're not getting information from the people that you want to be getting information from. So I look forward to uh, working on that. Um, as far as sort of the, the timeline of some of these things uh, and when uh, and what things uh, are we going to be talking about? And I know a lot of this, it sounds like it's going to be uh, work that's going <laughs> to be done, um, you know, more inside City Hall, but as far as like, when we can start coming back to talk about it. Yeah, so we are starting, so what we'll do after council feedback is take these and we'll be putting this in kind of into, into a work plan in some ways. I kind of see that as council talks about goals, this is going to be could could potentially be one of your goals for the next two years is to really kind of reinforce and really enhance a whole variety of our emergency preparedness and pr emergency planning. Obviously, that's a call for council, but this is a place we'll be spending a chunk of time and resources. There are some things that are already in process. There are some things we're going to kind of tier. So. Um, there'll be basically a work plan that will be who's responsible um, and when we think it'll be coming. If there's a need for resources, um, then we'll also be identifying that. And so for as far as today um, and what you are hoping to get from us, is it specific direction? Like, I mean, I thought that, I mean, Wayne and all of you have apparently put a lot of thought into putting this list together because I think it's pretty comprehensive, but... So what do you need to be able to go forth? So I think any if there's any other feedback from council, if there's anything we missed or if there's things that, um, you know, this is basically, uh, we weren't doing it formal as a report asking you to accept because this, does, this is not a report that's going to get, like, um, stuck on a wall somewhere. I mean, this or stuck on our, one of our bookcases. This is actually going to be transformed into a work plan. And honestly, this after action has evolved from when we first put it together and a first draft in kind of January, and we've continued to add to it as different things have come forward. So, you know, overall feedback that you have in general is what we're looking for and anything if you think there's something we should add. So in, in following up on that, I, I think obviously you guys are working on this all the time because that's your job, mm -hmm. and uh, we appreciate it. Um, I had a call the other day from Terry Lean at, at the Vets building, and he said, uh, Gary, I, you know, I want to let you know we're in this meeting about the remodel of the kitchen at the Vets building and that we're not going to have it ready for Thanksgiving. He says, is that going to be okay with you? I said, yeah, we'll just go rent all the stuff to do what we need to do. And, uh, but I was very pleased to hear that they're doing that because I think it's such an important thing because it – may not be a fire, it may be the earthquake in San Francisco or East Bay or whatever, and we're going to end up with people here, and we're going to have to be able to respond to that sort of thing. And, um, you know, so I appreciate the work that's going on, and I know there's a lot more to do. And, you know, I'd be willing to help in any way with the food resource, you know, on a larger scale, because I work on a national basis with folks, and I can help guide people to those, those sorts of things. So. Um, happy to help in any way on, on that end. Um, I think that uh, um, we're on the right track, but I'm, you know, in the back of my head, I'm, you know, thinking about the issues, brush uh, clearing and that sort of thing, water storage, that sort of thing, working with farmers and working with landowners up in the, those areas. Those are all things that, that I know that people get together, uh, especially in the farming community, are willing to work on those sorts of things. So any help that I can give back just in relationships, that sort of thing, please let me know. Thank you. Yeah, I, I guess what I want to say is thank you. Uh, and uh, like uh, Council Member Edwards said, this isn't going to be the, the last issue that's, you know, going to hit mankind. So, you know, there's earthquakes and everything else. And so I really appreciate you um, all working on this. And as a council member, um, I know that this was a great wake-up call, I think, for all of us. I remember when I was mayor of Sonoma, um, I got uh, contacted by a couple groups uh, about disaster plans. And I remember going to the city manager, and we had a plan, and 
Um, we did have an earthquake um, when I was the vice mayor, and I kind of saw a little bit going on. Um, thank goodness it didn't hit Sonoma um, as hard because it would have been uh, a little bit devastating. But knowing that you um, people are here makes me sleep good at night. Um, I do have a little bit of feedback, and it, it's kind of what um, – was said by the first presenter um, to never forget sometimes we th we think about um, vineyards as maybe our enemy or um, some people don't like um, some things but when the valley came together during the fire I think it showed that we are Sonoma and that and that's who we are and moving forward I think there should be discussions about having a little bit more access in that area I've been up to Cave Dell and that whole area since the fire, and um, I farm up there. And I realized that um, to be a firefighter up there had to have been the scariest moment because you're, you're literally trapped on, on all four sides because, um, you know, fire doesn't follow the roads. It goes from one canyon and up a ridge, and, and especially if you're coming in from an area and don't know um, the map. So um, I just appreciate what happened. And, um, the only feedback would be is I think that we do need to be a little bit um, prepared for when it happens again, um, you know, in 30 years. Maybe most of us won't be uh, in this capacity, but uh, it would be good to remember. And, and hopefully the report does show that, um, you know, we do have to have those open spaces. It doesn't have to be vineyard, but it has to be um, some kind of open uh, spaces that's recognized by the plan of where you can stop certain um you know fire behavior so thank you um oh i was just wondering in the um staff report it said that you're working with the county to figure out a new defensible space guidelines did i read that chief Aker? we are working with the county and the county has a draft for new defensible space um ordinance um it's a there's there's kind of a layered um, approach here um, as far as jurisdictions go because most of the areas that we're talking about uh, fall under CAL FIRE's jurisdiction and they already have those in place through the public resources code um, so when we go out we I was just on the phone yesterday with CAL FIRE and talking about going out and partnering and going out and doing some of those inspections together and um, really getting that word out to the, the hardest hit areas like Mayacamas and Glen Ellen um, as a starting point and then working, working back to other areas. Because I was, th you know, as we update our general plan, obviously we want to make sure, especially with this experience that we have, any input or anything that you think that we should change or updates that we're ready to do that as we enter into our general plan? Yeah, thank you. And it, it is my intent with uh, anything that gets adopted at the county level. Um, we're certainly, uh, we volunteered as the fire district to be a part of a pilot program if there was one. And then I would certainly, um, I would certainly encourage that to be you know, brought before you and for your consideration to have it apply here at the city as well. Thank you. Um, and just more broadly, just in terms of our, I mean, this was a comprehensive and great presentation with a lot of work. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> but just in terms of the perspective of our role, I just think that as elected officials, um, probably since we're not subject matter experts at all, our, um, role is to make sure that it actually happens because it's so easy with you know having to manage employees and get the business of getting the budget done and all those things to to not have the work plan happen so i think that it is in terms of not in terms of improving for the next disaster which is bound to happen you know i just i want to have us stay on it as a council and have regular check-ins and maybe it doesn't have to be that in depth but definitely a work plan with timelines and assigned people and uh, a clear plan for improvement in the specific areas i um they're addressed in the staff report but i particularly want to make sure there's improvement which is the first notification of people when there is um uh, a crisis an emergency one of the things I asked a lot of people during the fire, after the fire, was how did you hear about it? Just because I, it was sort of interesting to hear the stories. But in retrospect, um, you know, we shouldn't be asking that because we should be saying like, oh, there was a siren or we all got the alert. It was because we didn't have a uniform system of finding out about things that we needed that. I know 
Somebody suggested that there used to be a siren in, Ser in um, Sonoma. I know in San Francisco at 12 o'clock every day they do a siren. Um, but just something that, you know, maybe isn't a cell phone alert. But however the system is, I think that's really important that we have a uniform system for alerting everybody. Um, and then just the ongoing communications could be improved. Um, and... Um, and then a plan for what if it was like the next disaster like we were lucky the supermarkets were open but what if the supermarkets weren't open um and making sure i know they say it for earthquakes all the time but making sure that people know they're supposed to have what are you supposed to have three days of food what is it three four days i forget what it is but whatever you're supposed to have you're supposed to make it on your own for a week or whatever um that we encourage people to do that so well thank you uh, city council thank you so much for your presentation um it's another job I don't want to do. So um, I really appreciate that people are so committed and dedicated to do those wonderful things for all of us. Um, I wanted to ask Chief uh, Aker, the mutual support plan, you know, for agents, is that, that's already in place, I assume. Yes. But did the it get crazy with people going everywhere, which way with the fires? Yes, the, the mutual aid system is very, very well established. California was a leader on that um, back from the firestorms that hit LA in the 60s um, and has been exercised multiple times every year and, and is, like I said, very, very effective. Um, but the events on October 8th just overwhelmed the system. I mean, there were there were so many significant fires all happening at one time that there was the that even our system, which which as Bob said is is the best in the nation. I mean, other states, countries come to California to look and emulate our mutual aid system. Um, it it was stretched beyond its capacity, and we could not react quickly enough with as, with enough resources to handle all of those different incidents at the same time. Thank you. And Kathy, uh, with respect to Red Cross, it's, ch I think what I'm hearing is their mission has changed or what, what, whatever happened here did not uh, in include them in some way. Could you share that with everyone? Yeah, we actually learned kind of, I think this was an evolving situation that the county um, emergency management staff was actually having conversations with Red Cross a couple months before the fire and realizing that, frankly, they were not going to be able to do this. Um, and their mission has changed, and they don't have, I think, the resources, and clearly the number of emergencies they're running to and running to and running to. Um, you know, there were emer there were Red Cross folks that were, that like, that came in and were coming to help at our shelter, but those folks had just come off another emergency. They hadn't slept in three days. They couldn't walk in and take over. And I think for us, we also felt, um, and I know we, you know, we, I talked about this with uh, the principal of the high school and the staff there. You know, it, you got to a point where you wanted to take care of our own, and we weren't real comfortable kind of handing off, and frankly, there wasn't anyone to hand off to. So I think there, they may have a system to bring maybe physical resources in, which hopefully we could rely on, but the actual management of an EOC, um, and frankly, even some of the resources, I think we're, that's going to be a local responsibility going forward. And that's kind of a big change. We're going to have to figure that out. Thank you. It's interesting at the high school shelter, as you said, it opened up very early. I, I don't remember what time I got there, but um, I, sta I well, I, then the next day I signed up, some, signed up at the community center. And they were great, you know, coordinating that effort. But I, that First day, no, it was the second day I was at the high school and I knew people there and they said, oh, you know, you're a council member, you need something really special to do. I said, well, okay, I can handle that. I had to put the bottles on the table, the water bottles, that was my job. And they said it was so special that only a council member could line up all these bottles. So I wanted to tell you there was a lot of fun at that. People are really worried and very stressed out. But um, it was really wonderful to see the, the people coming together because there were actually people who needed, um, who were much older, and there, there were two women, um, a mother and a daughter from Artifacts. They were assigned to this family of young people who the house person was in her late 80s. She's the resident person, 
It was amazing. They stayed with the, those two women, stayed with um, those people for two days in the shelter, which I thought was admirable. And for people who don't understand these horrible, you know, emergencies, I was, in 1989, when we had the earthquake in San Francisco. I was on the 23rd floor, and um, I was the floor emergency person. And of course, we went and had coffee at those meetings, and you know, you got to meet the people from the other floors, and everything was really nice. And then I'm ha hiding after <coughs> I'm I'm under a desk after this earthquake, and I hear the loudspeaker say floor emergency manager managers to your station i thought crap that's me i have 300 people on this floor that i've got to get out safely so thank god you know there was some kind of a system and um but i you know i, I that was just my one time that i really had to do it do that and um i can only say i really admire you because i really had to pull some strength out from myself um, with these other people who are just, you know, sitting around smoking and having coffee and saying, wow, well, this is so fun. We get off from the work. You know, we're sitting here in a meeting. But when it hits, you've got to be prepared to do it. And we actually did a wonderful job at the Fox Plaza. So, you know, that's just my only experience. So I really appreciate I have no way of knowing what you must have felt or what you did. Uh, to, to make to make us feel safe. The only thing I know, I'm so glad this was um, this was addressed. The issue of communications, because I think each one of us have have uh, uh, somewhat of an issue with that. And um, and I've said to Kathy. In fact, we spoke today. The only thing I think people wanted to know: Am I safe? And if I'm not, what do I do? That's all. I mean, that's what people kept saying. And so. Um, you know, if we can maintain that uh, as our as our vision for what we're doing. The other thing, of course, <clears throat> so some of the, the responsibility of all of what you've collected, is that going to be part of what the Disaster Council does, or this is outside of their purview? Well, the Disaster Council's responsibility is to review an, any changes to the emergency operations plan before it comes to council, and also any agreements. That's what your Muni Code says. So there is... Um, there's a lot of staff work to do and things to get in, into place. And then once we have those kind of products, things, then we will bring those to the Disaster Council and then they will come to you. So that's what's outlined in the Muni Code. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Uh, unless somebody else has a comment. <clears throat> uh, one more thing that I thought of, um, which we had talked about it, uh, Kathy and I, in our meeting. So the interesting thing about last year is we had a lot of new people in City Hall, and every two years the City Council looks slightly different. So I feel like probably at least every two years there should be some sort of comprehensive overview for anyone who's new to get involved and to refresh uh, the Council, because it's not something we think about unless it's like time to think about it. Um, and then also, since we, the City, uh, and all the agencies are kind of brushing up on every th all our protocols and things. Um, I think it's a great time to encourage the public to do the same uh, for their own families. And so the SCOPE program, I'm more familiar with the CERT program, Community Emergency Response Team, which I think is a federal designed program. But could you explain the difference of what SCOPE is? And I know that, I, I just think that based on how willing people were to help during the fires, that this is something that they would definitely be involved in, with in as long as they it was like communicated in like a clear way and like sort of made very easy for people to sign up for i'll be happy to thank you uh so the scope program is more um not trying to train people for a response but to train people to be able to help themselves and to be prepared in the event of a disaster and, and whatever that disaster may be. Um, and so the training is um, less hands-on um, and more educational for folks. Um, and again, with the idea that, uh, and through experience we've learned this, that you know first responders can't be everywhere in the time of a disaster. And so we look on the front end to be able to empower people within the community to be prepared, to be able to take care of themselves, to know what kind of a list they need of things if they're told to evacuate, have that at the ready, um, know who they need to call, 
connected with their neighbors um, and be able to get out and take care of themselves because again we can't be there at every house to take care of everybody um, the cert teams are a little bit different they tend to maybe be a little bit more on the response side um, and it it takes um, a lot more time uh, investment on both uh, both our part but more importantly on citizens parts to go through the training and then uh, there's there's an issue with um, ongoing training and management and coordination um, and so it's a it's a it, it's a different system it's a different approach um, we feel like for us the scope program and being able to empower as many people as we can uh, to be able to be prepared and take care of themselves has the most value well and I'm not sure um, if the how the volunteer uh, situation is going to be going forward but it just seems to me that uh, in addition to all of the sort of trained uh, professionals <clears throat> when it comes to things like recruiting volunteers setting up setting up shelters and things perhaps there's an opportunity for uh, individuals who are willing to put in a little more time and consistently just to be uh, there to back up you know the next John Gurney or whoever is running these things so that it's not just starting from scratch every time something bad happens but we'll see and I have one more one more thing I wanted to share a pet peeve and I think uh, I mentioned this. I don't know if it was with you, uh, Chief Aker or Chief uh, Norbaum, but my pro my issue with no addresses on houses. It's pervasive here in Sonoma, and I guess it's cute for some homeowners, but it would be wonderful for you if we could do something about that. Because I, I when the and the chief said this is how we do it. It's almost like that gentleman in the commercial trying to throw away recycling. And he's going, uh, you know, I just think we need to be more responsible as residents to have our addresses on our homes. So we'll see how that works. Thank you. <laughs> At this point, do we have any reports or comments from, the, from our council? Yeah, Madeline, we, have, we need public comment. Oh, my so. God. So sorry, Mr. Dick. <laughs> Wait, I need to hit, to hit my gavel. Out for public comment. <laughs> Robert Demler, First Street West. Uh, Madam Mayor, with your permission I, and through your office, I'd like to thank the city council, the city staff, and all of our good first responders, <coughs> as I'm the token citizen here tonight, <laughs> and I find that... that um, <laughs> We get excited over pink doors and this place is crowded. This is very important and um, I, I apologize for my other citizens, fellow citizens. You all did a fantastic job and I think we know that at some level but not to the depth as even tonight for me and I've talked to lots of people here uh, and I experienced it. Uh, it so um, don't turn this light on tonight, please. Um, thank you. Uh, I hope that this uh, report in some form could be put on the city website in some form and, and, and maybe a notice in the IT that it's there because people don't normally troll the city's website just for fun. I do to see what's happening but uh, <laughs> uh, and somehow it would be nice also that for meetings like this where there could be, and I have been told never to say should, but should be uh, great public interest, maybe there could be something in the paper as opposed to just a notice on the city portal. So, you know, <laughs> because this is, this is important. You all did a fantastic job. We're eternally grateful. I mean, uh, we're giving anecdotes tonight, Madam Mayor. So I was sitting having dinner with some friends, Sid and Ella, on 2nd Street West on Tuesday night and we were saying, we're sitting here and there are a lot of people out there suffering and there are a lot of people out there helping those people who are suffering. And we are some of the luckiest folks in the world, we, those of us who live in, the, in Sonoma <coughs> proper. 
And I can't emphasize that enough, but I want more of my fellow citizens to know that, to say, so, so, so they can have an appreciation of what you all did. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Demler. Thank you. And uh, at this point, are there any council member reports or comments? I will give a quick report of my Sonoma County Mayors and Council Members Legislative Committee, where we had special guest Senator Phil Dodd. Uh, and I think there's at least 75 bills proposed currently related to fires. And uh, the amazing thing about our uh, regional representatives is that they have all gotten together and decided that if they all ask for the same thing, then they'll probably get it. So it's really impressive that they were, I felt that they were impressive uh, during the fires, particularly Senator, Do Senator Dodd and Congressman Thompson, and uh, they're doing good work now. Thank you. Anyone else? No. <laughs> no one. Do, city manager comments or announcements? None? Nothing tonight. Thank you. All right, then. Here we go. We're adjourned. <coughs>